My name is Rowan Ellis, and this happened to me in the late summer of 2014. I was a seasonal ranger for the National Park Service, had been doing it for years. Love the outdoors, love the solitude. Most folks don't get it, but spending weeks alone with just your backpack in the wilderness? That's where I felt most alive. This particular season, I was posted up at Olympic National Park in Washington State. Rugged, rain-soaked, gorgeous. Moss hanging from ancient trees like beards, mist curling through the valleys, that kind of place. My job was a mix, trail maintenance, monitoring wildlife, the occasional chat with over-enthusiastic tourists. Easy enough. Or, it was supposed to be. Around week three, I started noticing things felt off. Little things at first. Hairs prickling at the back of my neck, the sense of being watched, even when a sweep of the area turned up nothing. I chalked it up to fatigue, the isolation getting to me. Played some music loud on my camp speaker at night, tried to shake the unease. One morning, I woke up to find the laces on my hiking boots cut clean through. Sabotage seemed far-fetched, animal work looked messier. But I replaced them, weariness gnawing at me now. Then it escalated. I went for an overnight hike to survey a remote part of the park. It should have been routine. But on the second day, near an old grove of towering cedars, I came across something gut-wrenching. A deer carcass, not old, the scent of blood still sharp in the air. The kill itself wasn't odd, nature's course and all that. It was the way it was done. The carcass was ripped apart, viscera strewn about with a chilling precision. Whatever did this wasn't after a quick meal. It was sending a message. I radioed it back to headquarters, my voice shaking. They told me to get back to base camp likely a cougar with unusual hunting habits, they said. But I wasn't so sure. The dread settled into me like a fog. I kept the remaining days of my rotation close to camp, rifle slung across my back, the taste of fear sour in my throat. Then, the night before I was due to leave, it came. I was packing up my gear by firelight, when the hair stood up on my arms. A snap of a twig, just at the edge of the light. I spun around, rifle raised, but saw nothing. My heart beat a frantic rhythm against my ribs. The next few minutes are a blur. A blur of movement and noise. A guttural snarl that sent ice through my blood. I saw it lunge at me, a flash of sinewy limbs and bone-white teeth in the firelight. It was massive, easily twice the size of any wolf, its form impossibly stretched and lean. Fur clung to its patchy hide in clumps, revealing raw, grayish skin beneath. I squeezed off a shot, more out of panic than any clear aim. The creature yelped, the sound more beast than human, but it kept coming. I stumbled backward, tripped over a fallen log, pain exploding in my ankle. It was on me in an instant. Razor claws raked across my chest, sending trails of fire through my flesh. I screamed, kicked out wildly, but it was too strong. The stench of its breath was hot and rotten in my face. Its eyes, that was the worst part. Eyes sunken and black, like something dead peering out from inside its skull. The creature reared up, jaws opening wide. I braced for the killing blow, a scream frozen in my throat. Suddenly, a flicker of light cut through the darkness. Headlights. A ranger truck, careening down the access road toward my camp. The creature paused, 
its head swiveling toward the noise. Confusion must have crossed its monstrous features. For a split second, it hesitated. That saved my life. I scrambled back, dragging myself towards the tree lane. It turned, then vanished into the undergrowth with an unearthly howl. I heard the truck screech to a halt, shouts of my name, then darkness swallowed me whole. I woke up in a hospital bed, the sterile white a jarring contrast to the wildness of the forest. Bandages were wrapped tight across my chest and a cast encased my ankle. Turns out the other rangers got there just in time. The creature was gone by then, leaving behind only torn clothing and smeared blood as evidence of the monstrous encounter. They questioned me, suspicion clinging to them like fog. No one believed my description of the thing. Wild dog gone feral, they insisted. Trauma-induced hallucination, another suggested. I told them about the deer carcass, the cut bootlaces. They exchanged worried glances, but ultimately wrote it off. Official report an unidentified animal attack. I was put on medical leave, the scars on my chest a constant reminder. The shrinks poked and prodded, but I held on to my story. I knew what I saw. People whispered behind my back, damaged goods, gone a bit crazy from too much time in the woods. But I couldn't let it go. There had to be others. Other reports, other disappearances that fit the same twisted pattern. I spent my days holed up in my dingy apartment, the shades drawn, scouring the internet for whispers of similar sightings. Old park records, local legends, even those crackpot UFO websites. Anything that might offer a shred of validation. Then, I found it. An obscure blog dedicated to creepy backcountry encounters. A post from a hiker in the North Cascades, just a year before my encounter. They described an eerily similar creature lurking around their tent at night. More posts followed, snippets of stories, half-finished whispers about misshapen figures lurking just beyond the campfire light, about mutilated animal remains found deep in the wilderness. A pattern emerged, a chilling thread connecting these strange occurrences. The sightings were always in remote areas, targeting lone hikers or hunters. Descriptions of the creature were frustratingly vague but a few things were consistent, its unnatural height, the sparse fur, the skeletal face with those dead, empty eyes. The blog posts gave me an odd sense of, not comfort, exactly, but a grim resolve. I wasn't crazy. Something terrible was out there, lurking in the shadows of the wild. And if no one else would try to hunt it, to expose it, I would. I quit the park service. Didn't leave a forwarding address. Spent months training, getting myself in peak condition. I stocked up on supplies, high-tech trail cams, night vision goggles, a customized rifle that could punch through thick hide. My old ranger skills were an asset, but now, I wasn't tracking elk or monitoring owl populations. I was preparing for a different kind of hunt. I returned to the wilderness, but this time as a lone predator. I followed the creature's trail as best I could, the blog posts my only map. Camped in the places where it had been spotted, waited in the shadows with a hunter's patience. I grew thin, hardened by the obsession that thrummed in my veins. There's no glorious climax to this story, no epic battle where I vanquished the beast. Months in, I'd caught glimpses on my trail cameras, unsettling forms distorted in the grainy footage. But the creature was clever, almost preternaturally aware of its surroundings. 
it stalked me right back. Then came a cold, moonless night. I was hunkered down in a makeshift hideout in the remote backcountry of Glacier National Park, Montana. The wind whispered through the pines, carrying with it the same primal unease that had gripped me years ago. A noise, a soft pad of inhuman feet on the forest floor. My breath hitched in my throat. It circled my camp, slow and methodical. I could hear it sniffing the air, its claws raking the bark of trees. The smell of it wafted into my hiding place, musk, rot, and something chillingly foul underneath. The creature was toying with me, I knew it. Maybe it sensed my desperation, maybe its cruel intelligence reveled in the power of the hunt. But in that moment, something in me snapped. I wasn't some cowering prey anymore. I burst from my hiding place, rifle raised, screaming a wordless challenge into the night. It turned, and for a frozen moment, we locked eyes under the cold light of the stars. I fired, shot after shot, emptying, bounding away with uncanny speed. I stood there, chest heaving, the echo of gunshots ringing in my ears. Had I hit it? Wounded it? At dawn, I'd follow the trail, find out. But whether it's dead or not hardly matters. The hunt continues. The dawn broke, cold and gray. I followed the creature's trail, my heart pounding with a mix of anticipation and dread. Drops of blood marked its passage, but not much, considering the barrage I'd unleashed the night before. The thing was tough, resilient in some monstrous way. The trail was surprisingly easy to follow, almost as if the creature wanted me to find it. It wound through thickets of pines and over rocky ridgelines, leading me deeper into the wilderness than I'd ever ventured alone. Fatigue gnawed at me, but I kept pushing, driven by a relentless determination. Late in the afternoon, as the sun dipped below the treetops, the bloodstains led to a cave. It was partially hidden by a gnarled outcropping of rock and twisting vines. An icy dread crawled down my spine. This was it, the creature's lair. I took a steadying breath and tightened my grip on the rifle. There was no turning back now. I crept into the cave's mouth, the shadows deep and impenetrable. The stench of rot intensified, nearly making me gag. With a flick of my wrist, I activated the night vision goggles. The cage stretched before me, the greenish images flickering eerily. Bones littered the floor, deer, elk, something bigger I couldn't identify. And then I saw it, huddled in the deepest part of the cave. The creature was wounded, one of its hind legs mangled from my gunfire. Its movements were slow, labored. But as I approached, those dead, black eyes fixed on me, and I felt a surge of unease. Even wounded, it radiated menace. I raised my rifle, finger hovering over the trigger. For a moment, time seemed to stretch. It tilted its head, almost curious. There was no bloodlust in the gesture, none of the snarling hunger I expected. Just, intelligence, cold and ancient. Then, it spoke. The sound wasn't words, but guttural clicks and rasps, echoing off the cave walls. It was a language older than anything human, yet I somehow understood the intent. A plea, or a warning, perhaps. It didn't matter. My finger tightened on the trigger. This was the creature that ripped my life apart, that left behind a trail of mangled bodies and shattered minds. It had to end. I squeezed, and the gunshot echoed through the cave. 
the creature slumped to the ground, its unnatural life extinguished. I stood over its corpse, breath ragged in my chest. A wave of emotions threatened to overwhelm me, triumph, relief, a hollow kind of sadness. The weight of the kills, of what I'd become, settled on my shoulders. Outside the cave, the twilight painted the sky in hues of purple and gold, a stark contrast to the darkness within. I turned away, leaving the creature in its monstrous tomb. The journey back through the wilderness was a blur. The world felt tilted on its axis, the familiar trails and towering trees now twisted into something alien. I returned to civilization, but a part of me remained in that cave, with the echoes of a gunshot and the unblinking black eyes of a dying monster. The creature was gone, yet it still haunted my every step. I wasn't a hero, nor even a ranger anymore. I was something else, a hunter forged in the depths of a primal nightmare. The officials never got the full story. Bear attack, was the revised report. They'd sleep easier at night with that convenient lie. I didn't bother correcting them. I collected my meager belongings from my dilapidated apartment, the unread mail piled high on a dusty table. The pull of the wilderness was still strong, but tainted now, a constant reminder of the darkness lurking just beneath the surface. Where would I go? What would I do? I didn't know. But as the city lights faded into the rearview mirror, I felt a flicker of that old restlessness. The world was vast, brimming with unseen corners and shadows. And out there, somewhere, perhaps other monsters lurked, waiting for a hunter in the night. My name's Reed Gallagher and this happened to me back in 2016. I'd always loved the outdoors. Grew up fishing with my dad, spent teenage summers hiking in the Sierra Nevadas. When I went off to college, majored in environmental science. Figured it was the best way to combine my passion with making a living. After graduating, I landed a job as a backcountry ranger in Yellowstone. Finally, I could be out in the wild, protecting it. First few months were the dream. Routine patrols, educating campers, breathing that crisp mountain air. That September, though, everything changed. Got assigned a monitoring detail near the park's eastern boundary. Remote stretch of forest, not a place tourists wandered into by accident. My job was to track wildlife movement, look for any signs of poaching activity, standard stuff. It was supposed to be an easy in and out mission. Set up base camp in a meadow by a creek. Place had an odd vibe, a silence that felt more empty than peaceful. Figured it was just me adjusting to being out on my own for an extended time. But on the third day... I found the carcass. It was a bull elk, huge, but not killed by any predator I recognized. The thing was torn open, bones shattered like toothpicks. Found huge, misshapen tracks all around. Whatever made them had moved with astonishing speed and power. Sent photos to HQ. They got real interested after that, even sent a biologist out to help me. Her name was Dr. Jensen, no-nonsense type. I figured she thought I was exaggerating what I'd found. But the next morning proved me right. We were examining more of the carcass when I caught a flicker of movement in the trees. Pointed it out to Jensen, and her face went pale. We had just enough time to see it before it vanished back into the undergrowth. Tall, impossibly so. Lanky build, 
with skin stretched so tight over its bones that it was almost translucent, a sickly grayish color. Its head, that was what made my blood run cold. Elongated skull, jaw jutting out at a grotesque angle, filled with rows of needle-sharp teeth. Jensen turned and ran, yelling at me to do the same. I hesitated for one stupid second, and then it burst from the tree lane. It moved with a speed that defied nature, covering the distance between us in a flash. Jensen screamed, a short, choked-off sound. I saw the creature's skeletal hand close around her, crushing her in its grasp. Then it dragged her back into the trees, the sound of snapping bones echoing as she disappeared. Ran without thinking, back to my camp, back to the truck. Left everything behind in my blind scramble to escape. Radioed HQ, my voice barely above a panicked whisper. By then, the sun was setting, and I was surrounded by a wilderness that felt suddenly predatory, teeming with unseen dangers. They didn't believe me at first. Thought it was shock, grief, anything but the truth. Made me go back out with a whole armed team, search the area. No sign of Jensen, no trace of the creature. The higher-ups gave me the concerned look, the offer of counseling. After that, word spread quickly. Rangers looked at me with a mix of pity and fear. I became the Yellowstone Park weirdo, the guy who lost it out in the backcountry. After a mandatory psych leave, I quietly resigned. Couldn't stay there, knowing that thing was still out there, maybe stalking, hunting. But I couldn't go back to a normal life either, couldn't pretend like I hadn't seen what I'd seen. Spent my savings on gear and started drifting, checking out areas where similar sightings had been whispered about. Found a few others, people who'd lived through brushes with the same kind of uncanny horror. Learned to track the creatures, not well enough to find them consistently, but enough to know where their hunting grounds likely were. Also learned there were many kinds, some bigger, some smaller, but all sharing that elongated skull, the skeletal frame, the pure predatory malevolence. And I learned that people go missing in those places all the time. Hikers, hunters, sometimes even whole groups. Cases that are eventually closed, filed away as unsolved wilderness tragedies. But I know better. Word has reached me of another sighting up in Glacier National Park. Rugged, isolated country, the perfect terrain for those creatures. Gearing up to investigate. I won't stop until I kill one of them, get proof the world can't just dismiss. Doesn't matter how long it takes. Doesn't matter if it costs me my life. I owe that much to Jensen. Glacier was everything I had been warned to expect, raw, majestic, and utterly unforgiving. I based myself in a small town on the park's eastern edge the kind of place where locals give newcomers a long, measuring look. Started with the usual rounds, talking to other rangers, combing through old reports at the station, trying to find any pattern the bureaucracy might have missed. Found a few cases that made my skin crawl, a solo climber vanishing without a trace, a hunting party whose camp was found in disarray, blood splatters the only evidence of their fate. Nights, I hold up in a cheap motel room, maps spread out on the bed, hunting rifle close at hand. The dreams were relentless, not just the memory of Jensen's death, but glimpses of those shadowed eyes, the clicking hiss that echoed in my skull. After a week, I was ready to start heading out alone scout the backcountry areas the reports had pinpointed. Then, a curveball, a woman approached me in a diner. Sarah, she said her name was. 
Her brother disappeared in Glacier a year back, and she never bought the official line of a grisly attack. There was desperation in her eyes, a fierce hope I recognized all too well. Offered to let me see her brother's photos, files, anything that might help. Her place was a small cabin tucked away in the woods. Over mugs of bitter coffee, she laid out the details of her brother's disappearance. Experienced outdoorsman vanished from a remote trail during an overnight solo trip. Some scattered, unidentifiable gear found, but nothing conclusive. Amongst the photos she showed me was one of a footprint found near his abandoned campsite. My breath hitched. It was huge, freakishly so, with elongated toes and what looked like deep claw marks etched into the packed mud. The same kind of track I'd found back in Yellowstone. We gotta go there, I told her, a grim urgency settling over me. She balked at first, scared but also drawn in. It had become an obsession for her, just as it had for me. In the end, though, she agreed. We spent the next day packing, preparing. I didn't try to sugarcoat the danger for her, but I saw the same unwavering determination in her eyes that burned in my own. Drove as far into the park as the logging roads would take us, then set off on foot. The hike was grueling, the trail steep and overgrown. Sarah was tough but she wasn't a ranger, wasn't used to this level of exertion. It slowed us down. By the time we reached the spot where her brother's campsite had been, the light was fading. The place reeked of wrongness. There was a lingering stillness in the air, a sense of the forest holding its breath. The ground was torn up in some sections, and I found more prints just like the one in the photo. Something big and monstrous had passed this way, not so long ago. We set up a small camp, trying to mask our presence as best we could. Darkness fell heavy. It was Sarah's watch, but I barely slept, my senses screaming warnings. Around three in the morning, I heard her gasp. Sat bolt upright, rifle in hand, heart pounding. Over there, Sarah whispered, her voice choked. Just inside the tree line, two pinpricks of yellow light glowed in the darkness. They blinked, then were gone. Then, they were closer, studying us, filled with predatory intelligence. We need to move, I hissed, but it was too late. The creature burst from the undergrowth, a blur of bone and shadow. Sarah screamed, or maybe that was me, it all blurs together after that. I fired wildly, the muzzle blasts deafening in the night. There was a roar of pain, and it staggered back. But not far enough. It lunged for Sarah. I saw a flash of claws, the sickening sound of tearing, then a splatter of blood against the trees. I fired again and again. It howled, a piercing sound that scraped at my sanity. The gunfire must have spooked it, for a moment. It released Sarah, a crumpled heap on the ground, then melted back into the darkness. I crawled over to her, fumbling for my flashlight. She was a mess, barely breathing, her side shredded open. In the harsh beam of light, I saw enough to know it was too late. A sob tore itself from my throat. It was happening again, someone else dying because I couldn't stop those things. Sarah's eyes fluttered open, finding mine. She managed a weak, blood-flecked smile. He would have been, proud of me, she choked out, then coughed, a wet, choking sound. Her eyes once so full of desperate hope, glazed over. And just like that, she was gone. 
I cradled her for a long time, the full weight of the horror washing over me. Then, carefully, I dug a shallow grave amidst the towering trees. There was no time for a proper burial. I had to get out of there, had to warn people. When dawn broke, I hiked out, leaving Sarah behind and carrying the weight of two deaths on my shoulders. Found a ranger station, and this time they had no choice but to take me seriously, the haunted look on my face and the bloodstains on my clothes spoke louder than any plea for sanity. Now, there are task forces canvassing Glacier. Helicopters scouring the ridgelines, armed teams sweeping through the backcountry. They'll find signs, maybe even catch sight of a creature. Enough proof to shake the world's disbelief. But it will never be enough to bring back Jensen, or Sarah, or any of the others lost to the shadows. Me, I'm done waiting in the wings. When the official teams finish their hunt, my hunt will begin. This isn't just about proving the monsters exist, anymore. It's about revenge, bloody, merciless revenge for every life they've taken. My name is Rowan Ellis, and this happened to me back in 2012. I was a seasonal ranger for Yosemite National Park, loved the outdoors, the quiet. Pay wasn't great, but the views made up for it. Late August that year, there was a string of weird reports. Hikers going missing on day trails, the ones meant for tourists and families. Folks swearing up and down they'd stuck to the path, heard noises, seen, something. No bodies, no evidence of attacks, just vanished. Higher-ups chalked it up to disorientation, getting lost, the usual explanations. Me? I've spent enough time in the woods to know there's things that hide on the edges of our site. So, when the call came, I wasn't surprised. It was a couple this time, gone missing on the lower Yosemite Falls Trail. One of those crowded paths, impossible to just disappear on. I packed my gear, more out of habit than real expectation of finding anything. Figured the most I'd do was calm down some hysterical relatives. The day was hot, the trail buzzing with people happily snapping selfies by the waterfall. I headed back, into the thicker trees, where the crowds thinned. Then, I saw it, a smear of blood on a rock, just off the beaten path. Not much, but enough to send a chill down my back. Followed the faint spatters, and there, in a small clearing, things got ugly. It was the husband, or what was left of him. His body was, twisted is the best word for it. Limbs bent at wrong angles, skin shredded. Eyes wide open, frozen in a scream that would never reach his throat. I radioed it in, voice shaking more than I like to admit. They sent up a whole crew, forensics guys in those white suits that made the woods feel less familiar. I vomited behind a tree, the sick stench of copper and something rank clinging to the back of my throat. They scoured the area, found nothing. No tracks, no signs of a struggle. The wife was never seen again, another vanished statistic in those old, silent woods. I wasn't surprised, not really. The official report was animal attack, probably a mountain lion gone rogue. But I knew better. There's a kind of wrongness to a predator kill, a bloody messiness that this didn't have. This was precise, almost, surgical. That's when I saw it for the first time. Just a glimpse out of the corner of my eye a flash of movement between the trees. It was tall, too tall to be human. Lean and hunched over, 
with skin like the gray-brown of old bark. Eyes, when they caught the light, were a startling yellow. It stared right at me, head tilted like a bird assessing prey. My hand went for the gun at my hip, but it slipped away into the shadows before I could get a shot off. The crew found me by the blood-soaked clearing, gun drawn, yelling at the empty woods. They put it down to stress, the trauma of the scene, told me to take some mandatory time off. The thing is, I wasn't the type to see things, to jump at shadows. I'd been face to face with bears, dealt with angry drunks high on God knows what. But this? This shook me to my core. Because I wasn't just seeing some monster, I was being seen back. There was hunger in those eyes, and a cold intelligence that made me an uneasy kind of prey. It followed me, I think. Not every day, just enough to remind me it was out there. A rustle in the bushes on my drive home, a flicker of movement in my rearview mirror on those dark, empty roads. It started messing with my head. Made me doubt myself, which, in my line of work, was more dangerous than any cryptid. One night, I swore I saw it in my cabin window. Tall, gaunt silhouette pressed against the glass, those yellow eyes gleaming. Cracked a window open, fired a shot into the night. Scared the hell out of my neighbors, the cops showed up, found nothing as usual. Started dropping hints about quitting, about how maybe this job wasn't for me anymore. It didn't let up. Found a dead squirrel on my porch, its throat torn open with that same chilling precision. There was a message in it, I'm sure of it. A warning, or maybe an invitation. Folks started whispering, looking at me sideways, Ranger Ellis getting twitchy, they'd say. I started taking hikes in crowded areas, never went out alone. Packed extra ammo, slept with my shotgun propped against the bedpost. One morning, on a patrol up the mist trail, I found a fresh bloodstain. Just below it, carved into the smooth bark of a redwood, was a symbol. Crude, jagged, like it was made with a claw more than a blade. I'd seen it before, scratched into the stone back by the man's body. My hand traced the symbol, an echo of that day seared into my memory. Whatever this creature was, it was playing with me, marking its territory. The fear in my gut wasn't just about being hunted by some unknown beast, it was the realization that this hunt had turned into a sick game. I reported the symbol, of course. My superiors got that tight-lipped look, started murmuring about psychological evaluations. I almost wished it was some rogue animal, that, I could handle. But this, this was twisting me up inside, leaving me sleepless and paranoid. I started hearing things at night, the creak of the cabin floorboards becoming heavy footsteps, the wind in the trees sounding like rasping whispers. The line between hunted and haunted was starting to blur. Then came Emily. New ranger, bright-eyed and eager, just about the only one who didn't look at me like I was one step away from snapping. She reminded me of myself, back when the woods were a place of wonder, not dread. Made me feel guilty, like I was failing my duty by being afraid. The next missing persons report hit, I got assigned with Emily to track the area, a small loop off the main trails. I told her to stay close, voice tighter than I meant it to be. She just smiled, that eager, rookie smile I'd worn myself. It made me ache in a way I couldn't explain. We found the spot where the hiker had last been seen, another flash of blood on the rocks, scuff marks in the dirt. I crouched, studying those scuffs. 
They were big, too big for a man, and there was something about the shape, the spacing of the toes. Rowan? Something wrong? Emily knelt down beside me, oblivious to the danger. That's when it came out of the trees. Fast, impossibly fast, scooping Emily up in a flurry of movement. Her scream was cut off with sickening abruptness, and I was staring into those yellow eyes, filled with a terrible glee. I fired, emptying the magazine in blind panic. The creature stumbled, dropping Emily's lifeless body with a dull thud, but its skin rippled like water, bullets deflecting harmlessly. It screeched, a sound that made my teeth vibrate in my skull, and charged. I fumbled for a reload, but it was on me before I could manage. Its claws raked across my chest, burning pain exploding through me. Vision blurring, I shoved my knife up under its ribs in a desperate last-ditch move. It howled, and for a second, its eyes went wide, a flicker of almost human surprise flashing through them. Then it retreated, dissolving into the shadows with unnatural speed. I slumped to the ground, clutching my wounds. Emily stared up at the empty sky, eyes frozen in shock. It should have killed me, finished its game. But it didn't. Like it was savoring the fear, prolonging the hunt. They found me near dead, muttering about monsters. That was it for my career. Mandatory psych leave, the hushed whispers about PTSD following me like a hungry ghost. Sold my cabin, couldn't stand the isolation anymore. Moved to a crowded city, figured I'd be safer amongst the concrete and the noise. Still, every time I saw a flicker of movement in the corner of my eye, my heart would clench. People would call the cops on the crazy man shouting at shadows. The nightmares never stopped. Emily's face, twisted in that final scream. The creature, its yellow eyes promising it was never over. Sometimes, I'd dream of the park, smell the scent of pine and damp earth. I'd look up and see that damn symbol, carved into the trees, the buildings, scratched into the grimy sidewalks of the city. I started researching, obsessed. Old folk tales, Native American legends, anything that might hint at what I was dealing with. That's when I found them, whispers on the fringes of the internet, other disappearances in other parks, similar markings, survivors mumbling about creatures from nightmares. There was a pattern, slowly coming into focus. We weren't alone. In all these stories, they pointed to a chilling realization. These creatures weren't just predators, they were collectors. They toyed with us, drew out the terror, reveled in the power of the hunt. Maybe it was sport for them, or some macabre ritual I couldn't fathom. I don't know how many others are out there like me, broken husks haunted by what they've seen. We're the ones no one believes, ranting on street corners, dismissed as lunatics. Sometimes, I envy the dead. They don't have to live with the knowing, the constant gnawing certainty that it's never truly over. Maybe someday I'll get brave enough, or desperate enough, to head back into the woods, to hunt the thing that hunts us. Or maybe I'll just hide, a frightened animal waiting for the inevitable day those yellow eyes find me again. One thing's for sure, the woods, those places people escape to, they're not safe. There are old things lurking in the shadows, and sometimes, the shadows come looking for you. My name is Caleb Rhodes, and this happened to me back in 2008. Ex-Army, and after my tours I just couldn't handle city life anymore. 
took a job as a backcountry ranger in Yellowstone, figured it was the closest thing to peace I was likely to find. First few years were good. The usual stuff, lost hikers, illegal campers, the occasional bear encounter. Then things started to get unsettling. I'd be out on patrol and find, well, it's hard to describe. Carcasses, but not like anything I'd ever seen. Bones stripped bare but not in a way any predator I knew of would do it. Too precise, almost surgical. Found one, a full-grown elk, hanging upside down from a tree, not a mark on it except for how it had been drained of blood. Reported it, of course. My superiors chalked it up to poachers, but something about it just didn't sit right. Started hearing whispers from other rangers, too. Reports of strange noises at night, glimpses of something big moving in the shadows. The higher-ups hushed them, didn't want to spook the tourists. Tried to convince myself I was going crazy, stress, lack of sleep, all the things that mess with your head out in the deep woods. Then Lisa and Ben went missing. Young couple, out for a long weekend hike. Their campsite was found abandoned, gear torn up, blood, a lot of blood. I was on the search team that combed the area. No trace of them. That familiar wrongness settled in, and I knew it wasn't an animal attack. This was something else. Took matters into my own hands. Requested a transfer to the farthest backcountry sector, spent my off days hiking the old game trails, scanning the tree lean for any sign of movement. Kept a detailed journal, mapped out the locations of those strange carcass finds, hoping to form a pattern. The higher-ups started giving me sideways looks, probably figured I'd cracked under the pressure. One evening, just as the sun was dipping below the ridgeline, I saw it. Huge, standing at least eight feet tall, hunched over on two long, spindly limbs. Its skin was loose, hanging from its bones, a sickly pale color. And the head, long, drawn out, with a jaw that looked like it could snap a sapling in half. Its eyes were like yellow marbles, reflecting the dwindling light. For a moment, time seemed to freeze. Then it made a choking sound deep in its throat and lurched toward me. Instinct took over. I bolted, tore through the undergrowth with a speed I didn't know I still had. Gunfire echoed behind me, my training kicking in, firing blindly over my shoulder to hopefully buy a few seconds. Branches whipped at my face, but I couldn't stop, didn't dare look back. Crashed out onto an old logging road, heart pounding like it was gonna burst. Risked a glance back. Nothing. Had I imagined it? A breakdown in the middle of nowhere? But deep down, I knew that wasn't the answer. Back at HQ, I tried reporting the encounter. Learned a hard lesson that day, some truths are too horrifying for the system to accept. Got written up for erratic behavior, told to take mandatory leave. I packed my things. Drove out of Yellowstone, didn't stop until I hit the coast. But you can't outrun something like that. It followed me. I'd see a flash of movement out of the corner of my eye, the prickle of being watched when I walked home from the bar late at night. The dream started, filled with the sound of clicking footsteps and that chilling, hissing breath. Decided it was time to stop running turn and face the damn thing. Bought myself a cabin on a remote stretch of the Oregon coast. Rugged, isolated, good a place as any to make my stand stocked up on supplies, reinforced the doors and windows, and settled into wait. It came a few weeks ago. 
an unusually thick fog rolled in off the ocean, blanketing the shore. I heard its footsteps on the sand that night, slow and deliberate. The hissing outside my door made the hair on my arms stand on end. And under it all, a new sound, a sort of ragged breathing, like something both ancient and impossibly strong. I loaded my shotgun, the shells clicking into place with grim finality. This time, I wouldn't run. Didn't expect to survive, but I'd go down fighting. In the back of my mind, there's a sliver of hope, if I die here, maybe someone will find my cabin, my journals. Maybe they'll finally understand the kind of evil that hides in the wild places. Maybe, just maybe, they'll be ready for it when it comes for them next. The next morning, the fog still clung to the shoreline, thick and oppressive. I made myself breakfast, movements slow and deliberate. Figured it was my last meal, and I wanted to savor it. The creature, if that's even the right word for it, didn't attack immediately. It seemed content to circle the cabin, its footsteps crunching in the gravel, punctuated by that chilling hiss. A psychological game, wearing me down, breaking my nerve. I used the waiting hours as best I could. Clean my guns, sharpen my knives, a futile gesture, maybe but it gave me something to focus on. Reread my old journals, looking for any clue I might have missed, some pattern that could give me an edge. The carcass discoveries, the missing persons reports, they formed a rough arc along the western wilderness, a trail of death that led further and further from civilization. It was out there, not just one monster, but maybe many, and they were spreading. The sun was starting to sink when it finally came. Not a charge, like I'd expected, but a slow, methodical approach. The front window shattered inwards with a spray of glass and splintered wood. I fired my shotgun, the roar deafening in the small cabin, but it was hard to tell if I'd even hit it. The creature was half inside, its skeletal frame filling the window those jawbones snapping mere feet from my face. I emptied the gun into its torso. It staggered back, let out a screech that set my teeth on edge, then lunged again. I scrambled backwards, grabbing a knife from the table. Useless, I knew, but desperation makes you do dumb things. It clawed its way over the windowsill, shards of glass digging into its flesh. That was the first time I saw it bleed, not red, but a thin, black eye cord that sizzled as it hit the floorboards. The smell that filled the cabin was worse than rotting meat, a chemical stench that burned my eyes. I hacked at its outstretched arm with my knife, feeling it connect with bone. The creature jerked back with a pain howl. But there was a strength in it, a raw, unnatural power that pushed against my feeble resistance. It slammed me into the back wall, the impact knocking the breath from my lungs. My vision blurred. I fumbled for my pistol, but it was just out of reach. The creature leaned closer. Its eyes had a terrible intelligence, a cruel amusement. It opened its elongated jaws impossibly wide, and I saw the rows of needle-sharp teeth, then everything went dark. I woke, later. Time had warped in that final struggle. Lay sprawled on the floor, my body screaming in agony. I was alive, somehow. The cabin was a wreck, floorboards slick with that black blood. And the creature... It was gone. I forced myself to my feet, swaying with waves of dizziness. Had to get out of here, had to warn people. But where could I go? That question echoed in my battered mind as I stumbled outside. 
The fog was lifting, and through the haze, I finally saw why it had retreated. There were more of them. At least a dozen figures clustered on the beach, their skeletal forms stark against the gray ocean. They turned as one, their empty eye sockets seeming to bore into me. The enormity of it all hit me then, a wave of despair crashing over every last flicker of hope. I was never meant to win this fight. Maybe no one could. These weren't isolated monsters, this was an invasion, silent and insidious. They started towards the cabin, their movements slow and deliberate, like predators savoring their victory before the final kill. I thought of the gun, back inside. A noble last stand? It would change nothing, just give them one more trophy to add to their collection. Instead, I turned and ran. Not towards any salvation, I knew there was none. I just ran. Ran for the sheer animal need to stay ahead of that lurking dread for one more minute, one more hour. Ran until the ragged heaving breaths burned in my lungs and my legs gave out and I collapsed on the fog-shrouded sand. I'm waiting here now. For the tide to rise, for the creatures to find me, for whatever end these desolate shores have in store. It won't be a fight anymore, not really. More like the final act of a macabre play, one that has been performed countless times in remote corners of the world, with forgotten victims and unseen audiences. But here's the thing, I found a washed-up waterproof container beneath a piece of driftwood. A cracked old notebook and pencil inside. So I'm writing this as my last testament, a message tucked inside a bottle. Futile, most likely. But maybe someday, someone will find it, a ranger or hiker bold enough or foolish enough to venture this far. And maybe, just maybe, they'll believe the unbelievable. Maybe they'll prepare. Maybe they'll find a way to fight back against the shadows encroaching on our world. It's a slim hope, to be sure. But right now, it's all I have left. My name is Colton Webb. This happened back in 2012, while I was working a seasonal gig for the Park Service in the Olympic National Forest. It's a thick, old-growth place, feels like stepping back centuries. Mostly I did trail maintenance, fixing erosion, that sort of thing. Like the isolation, just me and the trees. That fall, I was assigned a remote area up near the Ho River. Had to hike in a few miles to the work site, so they gave me use of a backcountry cabin for overnight stays. Seemed like a sweet deal at first. Cabin wasn't fancy, but it was solid. Had a good wood stove, and I brought enough supplies to last a week. The first few days went smooth. Birdsong, crisp air, exactly the kind of thing I was looking for. Found some pretty significant trail erosion, figured it would keep me busy. Evenings. I'd sit by the fire, read a book, try to ignore the way the deep silence pressed in. That forest, it has a feeling of age to it, like it's seen things beyond counting. The trouble started on the fourth night. I was jolted awake by a scratching sound, like nails on wood. Figured it was a squirrel or something. Then came a low growl that made the hair on my neck stand on end. It wasn't any animal I knew. Sounded deep, guttural, filled with a kind of hungry rage. I sat up, heart pounding. Heard the scratching again, closer this time. It was circling the cabin. Too heavy-footed for a raccoon, too deliberate for a random animal passing through. It knew I was there. 
I grabbed my flashlight, hand shaking. Shone the beam through the window and gasped. There, pressed up against the glass, was the largest hand I'd ever seen. It was skeletal, the skin stretched tight and pale over long, bony fingers. But what chilled my blood were the claws, thick, curved, glistening wetly in the moonlight. The thing let out a hissing snarl and slammed its clawed hand against the window pane. The glass bowed inward, a spider web of cracks appearing. I stumbled back, eyes wide, heart slamming in my chest. It struck again, and this time the window shattered with a deafening crash. I yelled, more out of instinct than any hope of scaring it off. The creature, because I couldn't think of what else to call it, surged through the broken window. I barely had time to register its horrifying form before it was inside. It was huge, at least eight feet tall when it reared up to its full height. Its skin hung loose over its bones, a sickening gray color. The head, it was long and narrow, the jaw jutting at an impossible angle, filled with rows of needle-sharp teeth. In the eyes, empty pits reflecting the dim glow of the fire, filled with bottomless malice. Desperation fueled a burst of action. I lunged for my hunting rifle, the one that had been propped innocuously in a corner. The creature swiped a clawed hand at me, tearing open my shoulder. I cried out, pain momentarily overriding fear. I fumbled the rifle, precious seconds ticking by. The creature stalked towards me, a clicking sound emerging from deep in its throat. It raised a clawed hand to strike. I finally got the rifle up, aimed, and fired. The blast echoed in the small cabin, the recoil knocking me back. The creature staggered, letting out a piercing shriek. I fired again, and then again. Dark liquid spattered the cabin walls, the acrid smell of it filling the air. The clicking noise stopped. It swayed where it stood, then in a motion that was both fluid and utterly unnatural, turned and scrambled out the shattered window, disappearing into the night. I slumped to the floor breath ragged, my wound on fire. Didn't dare sleep that night. Just sat there, gun in hand, watching the empty window, waiting for the sunrise. When the first light crept through the trees, I staggered outside. The ground around the cabin was torn up, the trampled vegetation matted with that dark blood. I followed the trail with a growing sense of dread. It led into the thickest part of the forest, disappearing at the edge of a ravine. Whatever that thing was, it was heard, but I didn't doubt for a minute it was still out there. Packed my gear quickly, ignoring the hot burn of my injury. There was no way I was staying another night in that place. I notified HQ by radio voice on the other end sounded skeptical when I stammered out my story of being attacked by some sort of creature. Told me to stay put, they'd send a search party. Like a bunch of rangers would make a difference against that thing. Hiked back to the trailhead with every sense on high alert. Every rustle of leaves, every snapped branch made me jump. Half expected the monster to lunge from the undergrowth, claws outstretched, at any moment. Made it out before dark, adrenaline carrying me through the miles. A ranger truck was waiting, two familiar faces inside. Relief should have washed over me. Instead, my stomach twisted as I climbed in the truck. They didn't believe me. I could see it in their eyes, the subtle exchanges, the concerned frowns hidden when I looked directly at them. Figured they thought the stress of isolation had cracked me. Didn't try to explain any further. 
went through the motions over the next few days. The obligatory visit to the clinic, the interview with higher-ups, the carefully worded incident report that painted me as an overly jumpy seasonal worker who got spooked by shadows after one too many nights out alone. They offered me time off, a psych consult. I refused both. Just wanted it all to be over. But some part of me, a gnawing part one couldn't quiet, knew it wasn't over. That thing was still out there, biding its time, healing. It knew where I was. I started looking over my shoulder everywhere I went, the bustling city streets offering no sense of security at all. Took to carrying my hunting rifle just to feel some semblance of preparedness, got some strange looks for it, but didn't care. The creature had changed the rules of reality. I tried to tell myself it was my wound making me crazy, tried to ignore the feeling of being watched. Then the news reports started. Missing hikers in the Olympics, their disappearances eerily like the ones I'd heard whispers of in the past. Found signs of a struggle, sometimes traces of that weird black blood, but no bodies, no definitive answers. It was like a grim confirmation that I wasn't alone in this. Spent weeks trying to find anyone else who believed. Combed through old local legends, missing persons archives, anything that might offer a clue about what I was up against. Turns out, there were whispers, stories passed down through generations, of a creature from the deep woods, a predator that defied classification. They called it many things, the rake, the wendigo, a twisted spirit. But the descriptions always aligned, echoing my own horrifying experience. Finally, I found a name, Bryn Donnelly. Old recluse up in the Cascades, former military with a reputation for being a little off his rocker. Figured he was either exactly what I needed or another dead end. Tracked him down, showed up unannounced on the doorstep of his remote cabin. I must have looked crazed, wounded, on edge, rifle slung over my shoulder. He didn't turn me away, though. One look in his eyes told me he'd seen the same darkness I had, maybe fought it longer. The old man sat me down, poured some kind of bitter herbal tea, and told me about his lifelong hunt for the creatures. Not one beast, he said, but many, lurking in the forgotten corners of the world, slithering in the shadows just beyond human reach. Donnelly had a whole armory in his cabin, strange artifacts alongside the usual firearms. He showed me old journals filled with sketches of the elongated skull, the clawed hands, proof I wasn't crazy. Then he showed me the scars, physical and otherwise, from a lifetime engaged in a war most people didn't know existed. They're drawn to those who see them, he rasped his voice a whisper forged in too many sleepless nights. You're Mark now, boy. Didn't tell him my name, didn't ask for his help, but took what he offered, knowledge, a grim camaraderie, and a chilling purpose. It wasn't the life I'd signed up for, but it was the one I'd been handed. I left Donnelly's cabin armed with everything from old lore to military-grade night vision equipment, the weight of it settling heavy on my shoulders. The hiking trails hold no joy for me anymore. Now, when I walk in the woods, it's with a hunter's wary focus. I've become what that creature is, a predator in my own right. Every night, I sleep fitfully, dreams haunted by those burning yellow eyes and the sound of claws scrabbling on the windowpane. Donnelly and I keep in touch. He sends reports of sightings, and I go. Have skirmishes with the creatures across the country, in lonely forests and isolated stretches of desert. I've killed some, but there are more, 
always more. Wounds stack up, body and soul, and sometimes I wonder if it'd be easier to let them have me. But then I think of those missing people, of the faces on the faded posters, and the cold anger inside me hardens into resolve. This is my fight now, whether I asked for it or not. And I'll be damned if I let the monsters win. My name is Caden Tanner, and this happened to me in the summer of 2012. I worked for the Forest Service in the sprawling wilderness of Sequoia National Park, California. Trees like ancient giants, air so pure it pricked your lungs, that kind of place. Been a hiker since I could walk, so the job felt like a calling. Wasn't all sunshine and fresh pine, mind you. Folks underestimate the wild. Tourists wandering off marked trails, getting themselves lost. Rangers like me got stuck playing search and rescue half the time, a necessary evil, if a tad annoying. But one scorching August afternoon, the missing person call I got over the radio wasn't the usual weekend warrior gone astray. Turned out, this was different. This was bad. The missing fella's name was Elian Ward, experienced outdoorsman, survival skills instructor. Elian wasn't some schmuck in flip-flops. He knew these woods, knew what to do, what not to do. That fact gave me a sinking feeling right off the bat. Met Elian's sister, Tabitha, at the trailhead. She was a mess eyes red-rimmed, and I couldn't blame her. Elian should have been back two days ago. I started with the usual, retracing his intended route, checking designated campsites, nothing. We expanded the search grid. Tabitha, a couple other rangers, and I combed through the backcountry, calling out Elian's name until our throats burned. Day three is when it all went to hell. We found his pack, or what was left of it. Slashed open, gear strewn everywhere like some wild animal ripped through it. A cold knot twisted in my gut. That wasn't bear or cougar territory. Too methodical, too intentional. We called for backup that night. Next morning, a whole crew descended, folks with search dogs, the works. Just as they were briefing us, one of the dogs started baying, straining against its leash. The handler followed the dog's lead, heading further off trail and deeper into the dense pines. The rest of us scrambled to keep up. Maybe half a mile in, under the mossy gloom of the old growth, we found him. Or rather, what was left of him. Elian was strung up in the trees. Not hung, I mean, more like, splayed open, his insides pulled out and draped over the branches. Blood pooled sticky and black on the forest floor. I gagged, but it was Tabitha's scream that cut through the air like a knife. She collapsed, and it took two rangers to hold her back. The sight, it wasn't just gruesome. It was ritualistic like a sick sore of offering to the trees. I knew, right in my bones, this was an animal work. The investigation was a mess. Police, FBI even, swarmed the area, but came up with zilch. Interviews with Tabitha turned up nothing suspicious, her brother had no enemies, no dark secrets she knew of. The forensics boys found a few hairs, unidentifiable, and some strange prints, too big for a human, but not quite matching any known animal either. Official report ruled it an animal attack, likely a rogue bear with some, let's say, odd culinary tendencies. Cover-up job, clear as day. After Elian, I stayed on patrol. 
but my heart wasn't in it. The woods felt heavy, watchful, like something out there was holding its breath. That thing, whatever had ripped Elian apart, got away with it. Worse, it left the rest of us knowing it could strike again. Other disappearances started happening. Hikers, seasoned folks, vanished without a trace, followed by the same eerie calling card. Some mutilated remains turned up, others nothing at all. We rangers kept a watch, up the patrols. Folks whispered about a monster, a cryptid in the woods. Me? I never called it that. Monster sounds too fictional. This thing was flesh and blood, even if I couldn't picture what it looked like. Then one day, I was leading a scout troop, young lads, eager faces. Show them the beauty of the forest, right? We're miles from camp, when a rustling starts up ahead. The kids go quiet, eyes wide with a mix of fright and excitement. I tell them to stay put as I creep closer, rifle raised. Through the leaves, I see it. Tall, monstrously tall. Lean frame, covered in patchy, grayish fur, crouched down like a spider. Then it rises, and I catch a glimpse of its head. Long snout, full of needle-sharp teeth. Eyes like two black pits and a skull too narrow to belong to anything human. It spots me, twitches, like it's weighing its options. The boys behind me start to whimper. I yell at them to run, just run. They scatter as I let loose a shot at the thing, knowing damn well it won't do a thing. The creature surges after the kids, all screeching and slashing claws. I fire again and again. It howls, a chilling, unearthly sound, but keeps going. The kids ran, their shouts echoing through the trees. I stumbled after them, fear fueling me more than adrenaline. Two of the boys were lagging behind, and the thing was gaining ground. Desperation made me do something stupid. I split off from the fleeing kids heading deeper into the forest, hoping to draw the creature after me. It worked. The guttural howls changed pitch, and I heard the heavy thud of its feet change direction. I kept running, tripping over roots and fallen branches. My lungs burned, and terror fueled my every step. I had no plan, just the primal instinct to get away. Then, I saw it, an old, abandoned ranger cabin slumped against the hillside. I burst inside, slamming the heavy wooden door behind me. Dilapidated place, but the door was solid. My heart pounded so hard I thought it'd break out of my chest. I fumbled for my rifle, hands shaking. The thing slammed against the door. The impact sent a jolt through the entire structure. The door held, but for how long? I crept to the tiny window, barely more than a peephole. The creature paced outside, scratching at the walls, its growls laced with hunger and fury. It couldn't figure out how I vanished. I took a few shuddering breaths, trying to think. There was no radio in here, cell reception a distant dream in this part of the woods. No way to call for help. I spotted an old wood stove in the corner, and an idea sparked. If I could generate enough smoke, maybe it would drive the creature away. Or at least obscure its vision while I slipped out another. I scavenged every scrap of paper and kindling I could find shoving it into the belly of the stove. Acrid smoke started to billow out. The creature outside shrieked, the noise making my ears ring. It clawed furiously at the walls, trying to find entry points. Then, through the haze, I noticed it. 
A back window, the wooden frame half rotted. It was a tight squeeze, but maybe my only chance. I wriggled through, thorns tearing at my clothes, then sprinted for the tree line. The creature must have seen me. It burst from the smoke-choked cabin with a roar, scrambling after me with terrifying speed. But it was blinded by the fumes, coughing. That bought me a head start. I stumbled through the forest, fueled by pure terror. I had no idea where the kids were, but I hoped they'd made it back to the trail or run into another group of hikers. I didn't stop running until I couldn't anymore. Only then did I dare look back. Nothing but trees. I slumped to the ground, sobbing, unable to catch my breath. My body ached, but relief washed over me, mingled with a bone-deep chill. I was alive. But those kids, the guilt was a fresh wound scraped raw. It took hours before I made it back to the trailhead. Emergency teams were there, worried faces crowding around me. I stammered out my story, about the creature, the scouts. They stared at me like I was delusional. The official search found no trace of the kids, not a single campsite or discarded candy wrapper. The creature in the woods remained a horrific mystery. I never regained my reputation. Folks looked at me sideways, whispered the words unstable and traumatized. They shipped me off on a forced sabbatical, a shrink prodding me to recall my hallucinations in detail. I play their game, mouthing the platitudes about grief and processing trauma. But I know what I saw. They dismissed Elian's death as an anomaly. After my experience, it couldn't be ignored. The park service hushed it up, a shadow narrative spun for the press releases. I never went back to Sequoia. My resignation letter cited personal reasons. The truth is, I don't think I could face those woods again. Sometimes, in the gray stillness of a sleepless dawn, I hear the scrape of claws against wood and the inhuman howls of a hunger that can never be sated. Some wounds don't scab over, and some nightmares stalk you right into the waking world. My name's Eric Lundgren, and this happened to me back in 2010. I've been a ranger in the Great Smoky Mountains for longer than I care to admit. Seen a lot mostly the best side of humanity out enjoying nature. Also seen some things that don't fit into guidebooks, things most folks wouldn't believe. That fall, I was assigned to a backcountry patrol, two weeks on the trails less traveled. I welcome the solitude. Reminds me why I got into this line of work. First week went by without incident. Crisp mornings, leaves starting to turn, the good stuff. Found a few abandoned campsites, usual litter to clean up. Then, on the eighth day, things took a turn. I was hiking back to a shelter for the night when I noticed the change. Silence. Not the regular peaceful kind, or wrong kind. No birdsong, no squirrels rustling in the leaves. Even the buzzing of insects seemed to have stopped. Skin prickled, that primal instinct that something wasn't right. Pushed on toward the shelter, hand hovering near my sidearm. The unease grew stronger with every step. As the trees thinned out near the clearing, I saw why. There was a carcass in the middle of the shelter, a deer, or what was left of it. Not predator kill. This thing had been disassembled. Bones were picked clean, unnatural precision to it. I froze, every sense on high alert. The smell hit me then, rotting meat, 
mixed with a sharp metallic tang I couldn't place. Heard a soft hiss from the tree lean, like air escaping a punctured tire. Drew my pistol, backed away slowly. My boot heel snapped a twig. That's when I lunged out from the shadows. At first, my brain wouldn't process what I was seeing. It was tall, too tall for anything known to walk these woods. Skeletally thin, with skin stretched so tight over its bones that it looked almost translucent, a sickly gray color. The head, that was the worst part. Long and narrow, with a jaw full of jagged teeth, like broken glass. Its eyes, empty pits that still somehow seemed to burn with a cold light. It let out another hiss, a sound that raised the hair on the back of my neck. I'm not a man who scares easy, but this, this wasn't some misidentified bear. This was pure malevolence, ancient and wrong. Survival instinct overrode training. I fired off a shot, more to startle the thing than actually hit it. The creature jerked back, letting out a screech that set my teeth on edge. That bought me a second. I turned and ran, not looking back. Burst through the undergrowth, lungs burning, heart pounding like a drum gone mad. Gunfire echoed behind me, the rest of my magazine, emptied in blind panic. The crashing sounds of pursuit faded, but I didn't stop running until I made it to a fire road. Flagged down a passing truck, the driver looking at me like I'd lost my mind when I stammered out my story. Called it into HQ. They sent a search team, but they found nothing. No trace of the creature or even that torn up deer carcass. Officially, it was ruled a stress-induced episode. Unofficially. I saw the looks they exchanged, the unspoken questions. They humored me, told me to take some time off, but I knew they thought I'd cracked. Didn't go back to that part of the Smokies for a long time. But that changed a few months later, when hikers started disappearing on the same stretch of trail I'd been on. Never found a trace of them, no remains, no gear, no sign of struggle. Just vanished into thin air. That's when I knew it was no hallucination. It was real. It was out there, hunting. And anyone who crossed its path was prey. Nights, I'd lie awake, hearing the hiss of its breath in the darkness, seeing those hollow eyes staring at me. Tried to drown out the memory with whiskey, didn't help. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore. Packed my gear, a hunting rifle this time, and headed back into those woods. Didn't report my plan to HQ. This was between me and that creature. Figured if I could track it down, destroy it, maybe those disappearances would stop. Maybe I could buy some peace, even if it cost me my life. I spent days combing the woods, venturing deeper than any map would advise. Followed old deer trails, scanned the trees for any mark or sign. My every sense was on edge, expecting its ambush from behind any tree, from every rustle of leaves. The forest itself seemed to hold its breath, its silence a mockery. And all the while, I knew it was watching me. A prickling down my spine, the feeling of eyes burning into my back. I'd turn suddenly, rifle raised, but there would be nothing there, just the empty woods. It was toying with me, I realized, testing my resolve, wearing me down. Sleep came in fitful snatches under the thick canopy. My dreams plagued by clawed hands reaching from the shadows and that piercing hiss echoing through the dark. Every morning, the hunt resumed, a grim, relentless chase where I was both hunter and hunted. Then came the rain. A cold, 
driving downpour that turned the forest trails into muddy streams and the rocks into treacherous slides. Made tracking damn near impossible, and that's when I slipped. One second I was scrambling down a slick ravine, the next I was tumbling, rifle flying from my grasp. Pain exploded in my ankle as I hit the ground, and I let out a yell more of frustration than pain. Above me, I heard a scrape of something dislodged, then a low, guttural growl. I scrambled for my pistol, heart pounding. From the top of the ravine, it peered down at me. The creature, closer than it had ever been. In the dim, rain-filtered light, it seemed even more grotesque. The elongated skull glistened wetly, and I got a clear look at its claws, long, curved, stained with what I desperately hoped was old blood. It cocked its head, those hollow pits of eyes seeming to bore into me. In that moment, I think it knew that I was broken, that the game was nearly over. I raised my pistol, handshaking. But it was too late. The creature launched itself from the top of the ravine, landing on me with a force that knocked the breath from my lungs. I barely had time to register the needle teeth sinking into my shoulder before the world went dark. I came to with a ragged gasp, pain lancing through my body. The creature was gone. My pistol, too, probably knocked away in the struggle. My ankle throbbed, and I could already feel it swelling, most likely broken. Rain dripped on my face, cold and steady. I lay there, staring up at the gray sky, the finality of it sinking in. I wasn't getting out of these woods. Maybe some search party would find me, what was left of me, after the creature was done with its meal. A fitting end, some might say, for a foolhardy ranger who ignored the rules and delved too deep. Rage surged through me, hot and bitter. Not at the creature, it was what it was, a predator following its nature. My anger was at the world at the system that would write this off as an accident, an unfortunate loss. My fight, my sacrifice, it would all be in vain, swallowed up by bureaucracy and the relentless churn of time. Unless. My hand fumbled in my pack, found the waterproof case, and the small notebook and pencil inside. With trembling fingers, I started to write. A message a warning. I described the creature in painstaking detail, its hunting grounds, my own theories on its nature. I listed the names of the disappeared, people the world had forgotten, but who I knew were connected to this evil. Hours passed. My vision blurred, pain radiating through my body. Rain turned to sleet, and still I wrote, forcing my stiffening fingers to obey. The notebook was soaked through by the time I finished. With the last of my strength, I tore a strip from my shirt and used my own blood to write two words on the cover, still hunts. I tucked the notebook beneath a rock, hoping against hope that someday, someone else might find it, a ranger, a hiker, anyone with the courage to believe and the will to fight back. Then, I turned my face to the darkening sky and waited. The end, when it came, wasn't what I expected. No flash of pain, no final struggle. Instead, there was a chilling numbness spreading from my wounds, a strange detachment. The forest sounds faded, and the patter of rain turned into a distant lullaby. And through the fog, I saw them, the missing hikers. Not as mangled bodies, but faces etched in my memory from faded posters at trailheads. They were smiling. Waiting. Panic flared briefly, then subsided. A strange peace settled over me. In the end, maybe we weren't so different, me, the creature, 
the disappeared. All of us just pieces in a much larger game, a cycle of life and death playing out in the deep heart of these ancient woods. My eyes closed. And for the first time in a long, long time, I slept. My name's Kean Walsh, and this happened to me back in 2008. I was a park ranger in Yellowstone, the kind of job city folks romanticize but has more paperwork than actual bear sightings. Married, young daughter, life was good, ordinary. At least, it was until that summer. August started off slow, quiet. Then the calls began trickling in. Hikers, spooked, talking about eyes watching them from the trees, strange noises echoing through the canyons. Standard wilderness weirdness stuff, easily explained away. Except, some of the tourists came back, changed. Eyes hollow, skin gone clammy, muttering about things that should only exist in nightmares. Then Sarah went missing. She wasn't a hiker, just a young woman, wrong place, wrong time. They found her car abandoned by a pull-off, nothing else. No leads, no clues, like she'd vanished into thin air. Something about it didn't sit right, not like the usual runaways or folks taking a self-imposed break from their lives. It was too clean. I volunteered for the search parties. Needed to do something, anything but sit at home imagining the worst. Days of scouring the same trails got monotonous, the backcountry a blur of green and brown. Hope dwindled with each passing hour. It was on the fifth day that I found it. Not Sarah, God no, but something worse. There's a part of Yellowstone most tourists don't see. Old, gnarled forests on the park's edge, the kind of place that feels untouched since the world was young. That's where I stumbled across the clearing, and something inside me flipped from ranger to prey. The ground was littered with bones picked clean. Elk, deer, maybe bigger, hard to tell in the dim light filtering through the trees. In the center of the clearing, a single, massive tree. Its bark had been stripped away in places, the exposed wood carved with symbols, crude spirals, jagged lines. It pulsed with a wrongness that set my teeth on edge. Something shifted in the shadows and I was face to face with it. The creature, God, I still don't know what else to call it. Tall, at least seven feet, its body a skeletal frame draped with leathery skin the color of wet earth. The head, it was elongated, skull stretched forward with a mouthful of needle-sharp teeth. Eyes, if you could call them that, were pits of inky blackness, shining with a hungry sentience. Paralysis hit first, then instinct kicked in. I fumbled for my gun, voice gone, throat locked in silent terror. The creature tilted its head, studying me, then vanished into the trees with unsettling speed. I scrambled back to the ranger station, babbling my report. They sent me home. Mandatory psych eval nonsense. I knew what I saw. The dreams began that night. Not about the creature, but Sarah. She was alive, somewhere deep in the woods, eyes pleading for help. When I woke, sweating and shaking, there was a conviction burning in my gut, they were connected. The next morning, I chucked my badge in the trash. Didn't bother with explanations, wife's tears, none of it mattered. Bought myself a hunting rifle, supplies, the works. People whispered in the town, Keen Walsh finally going off the deep end. Let them. It wasn't hard to find the clearing again. 
I left my truck miles away, slipped into the woods like a ghost. There was no sign of the creature at first, but the air crackled with tension, the silence too heavy. I waited by that monstrous tree, running through scenarios in my head, preparing for the inevitable. Hours ticked by. Birdsong died out, replaced by a faint rustle of leaves on windless air. I whirled, rifle raised, but it wasn't the creature. Sarah stood on the clearing's edge, gaunt, filthy, cuts crisscrossing her bare arms. Kean, her voice was a ragged rasp. Before I could take a step, it lunged from the trees. Sarah screamed, a cut-off sound swallowed by the deepening gloom. The clearing became a blur of motion. I fired, again and again, the roar of gunfire shaking the trees. The creature was fast, impossibly so. Leaping, dodging bullets, but it wasn't unharmed. Thick, greenish-black blood spattered across the mossy ground. Rage surged through me, hot and reckless, and I charged, rifle stock my only weapon. I slammed the rifle but into the creature's exposed ribs, hearing a satisfying crack. It snarled, a sound like fingernails on a chalkboard, and spun towards me. I ducked under its swipe, the claws tearing through my jacket like paper. Pain flared across my shoulder, but adrenaline numbed the worst of it. I whirled, swinging the rifle in a wide arc that caught the creature square in the jaw. Its head snapped back, teeth shattering. There was the sickening crunch of bone. Then, it was over. The creature crumpled to the ground, twitching, its movements growing weaker. The stench of its blood was thick in the air, stinging my eyes and making my stomach churn. Sarah was gone. Vanished back into the trees as if she'd never been there. I approached the creature slowly, rifle still raised. Its eyes, those abyssal pits, were locked on mine. An animalistic fear flickered there, something almost recognizable. With a final, shuddering breath, it went still. A noise behind me, a twig snapping, perhaps. I spun, gun at the ready, but the forest was silent. An uneasy feeling settled in my gut. It was like a predator switching roles, like the hunter had become the hunted. Days blurred together after that. There was the stumble back to civilization, the police reports, the gaping disbelief of the other rangers. The story stretched, morphed. Keen Walsh, unhinged, slaughtering an endangered predator. They never believed my account of that monstrous tree, of Sarah, of the eyes peering from the depths of the woods. I never went back to my old life, couldn't bear the thought of the house Sarah and I built, the daughter who'd never truly know her mother. Instead, I became a drifter, a ghost haunting the edges of wild places. Some whispers paint me as the villain, others as a tragic hero, neither sit quite right. I learned to survive, to listen to that instinct screaming at the back of my mind. The woods, once familiar territory, felt alien and hostile. I'd see flickers of movement in the corner of my eye, hear phantom footsteps following mine. There were nights I'd swear I could feel those inky black eyes burning into me, watching, waiting. The dreams never truly stopped. Not nightmares anymore, but twisted visions of Sarah trapped in a place between worlds. She's become my reason, my obsession. The search for her took the place of the life I left behind. Aftermath isn't the right word, not really. It implies closure, some sense of finality. My aftermath is ongoing, a ragged, bleeding edge of existence. 
Sarah, the clearing, the creature, they're not some ghost story to tell around a campfire. They're constants, shaping what's left of me. Some nights, out in the wilderness, I think I catch a glimpse of her. Fleeting, fading quickly as mist on the morning breeze. It's those glimpses that keep me going, keep me from falling apart completely. I hunt in a different way now. There are things lurking in the shadows, hiding in those corners of the world we pretend don't exist. And if there's the slightest chance of finding Sarah, of making that damn tree pay for what it took, I'll walk that path until my dying breath, consequences be damned. My name is Wyatt, and this happened to me back in 2010. I was working as a wilderness guide in Alaska then, taking clients on multi-week trips, navigating the backcountry. People who paid top dollar for the authentic experience, whatever the hell that meant. Mostly, they wanted bragging rights and photos, not a real taste of how harsh and unforgiving that land can be. This particular trip, I had a group of two, a father and son from Texas. The dad, Gary, some big oil executive with a booming voice and wallet to match. The kid, Ethan, was quieter, watchful. Seemed more in tune with the wilderness than his old man. We were heading into the gates of the Arctic, brutal, beautiful stretch of mountains and tundra. Figured it would be a nice change from the usual Denali routes, shake off the crowds that clogged even the Alaskan wild these days. First week went smooth enough. Weather held, the Texans even managed not to complain too much about the bugs and lack of cell reception. Had a routine down, set up camp in the late afternoon, I'd cook up a hearty meal and we'd linger by the fire as the long northern dusk settled in. Then, one night, around day five or six, things took a turn. I was doing dishes by the creek when the hair stood up on the back of my neck. That primal sense of being watched. I scanned the trees. Caught a glimpse of movement, a flash of something pale disappearing into the undergrowth. Figured it was a caribou or a bear at first, but something about it felt wrong. Didn't mention it to the Texans, not wanting to spook them. But that night, as I lay in my tent, I couldn't shake the unease. The woods were too damn quiet, no rustling of small animals, no nightbirds. Then, I heard it, a crunching sound like heavy footsteps on gravel, circling the camp. Got my rifle, but the noises stopped when I slipped outside to investigate. The next morning, Ethan approached me while his dad was still snoring in his tent. Did you hear something last night? He asked, his voice low. Maybe, I said cautiously. Think it was a bear? His eyes narrowed. No bears around here move like that, he said darkly. I finally caved, told them about the strange movement I'd seen the evening before. They exchanged looks, and I saw a flicker of real fear in Gary's eyes that his bluster couldn't quite cover. The rest of the day, there was a tension hanging over us. Every rustle of leaves made me jump. I found tracks that afternoon near a stream, and my heart sank deeper. Too big for a bear, and shaped all wrong. The claws had gouged deep grooves into the mud. That night, we kept the campfire burning high, took turns on watch. That primal fear gnawed at all of us, the knowledge that there was something out there smarter than an animal, and deadlier too. Then came the morning we hiked up into a high mountain pass. The trail wound through a stand of stunted spruce trees, visibility poor on account of the thick fog. 
the Texans were strung out behind me, Gary complaining the whole way. Suddenly, Ethan, who was directly in my wake, let out a muffled cry and stumbled forward. He tripped over something and fell hard. I rushed forward. It was a tripwire, strung between two trees, crude but effective. As Ethan struggled up, a heavy rock whizzed out of the fog, just missing my head. Heard a sickening thud and Gary let out a strangled yell. I whirled around to find him pinned to the ground, a rough-hewn wooden spear jutting from his thigh. Panic threatened to swallow me, but survival instinct kicked in. I yelled for Ethan to get back, away from the tree line, then took cover behind a boulder. The fog was our only advantage, masking our exact location. I peered through the swirling mist, heart pounding. There, half obscured, was a shape moving between the trees. It was humanoid but too tall, too lanky. The skin seemed stretched tight against a skeletal frame, a sickening gray color. Its head, that was worst of all, long, narrow, the jaw jutting obscenely, filled with needle-like teeth. It hissed, low and menacing, and the sound cut through me. Something ancient and malevolent emanated from the creature, and deep down, I knew it wasn't going to let us go easily. I fumbled for a clear shot, but the creature was too agile, weaving through the fog like smoke. Ethan whimpered, his eyes wide with terror. I had to get us out of there, before it decided to strike again. Ethan, listen. I barked, keeping my voice low. On my mark, run back the way we came. Don't stop, okay? The kid nodded, his lower lip trembling. Now! I yelled, vaulting from behind the rock. I fired a shot into the trees more to make noise than to actually hit the thing. The creature shrieked, a rasping, inhuman sound that sent chills down my spine. Ethan took off. Without another thought, I followed, rifle clutched tight. We ran blind, the fog our enemy as much as our savior. Branches whipped across our faces, stones rolled underfoot as we scrambled downhill. The creature's screeches seemed to be fading, replaced by the relentless pounding of our hearts. We stumbled back to camp hours later, scratched and bleeding but miraculously in one piece. Gary was alive, barely. The spear had narrowly missed his femoral artery, but there was a lot of blood. I tore strips from my shirt, fashioned a crude but functional tourniquet, and prayed it would hold until we could get him proper medical attention. Breaking down camp was a frantic blur. I shoved Gary into the biggest backpack, lashed him in as best as I could. The weight nearly toppled me, but adrenaline kept me upright. We staggered away from that cursed pass, putting as much distance between ourselves and that thing as we humanly could. I radioed for emergency evac. Told them an animal attack, keeping the truth too unbelievable for even the most hardened backcountry rescue folks. They arrived the next day, a bright orange chopper dropping from the skies in a clearing we'd managed to hack out. Ethan and I watched as they loaded Gary onto the stretcher and winched him up, into the whirring belly of the beast. He never regained consciousness. Died two days later in a sterilized Anchorage hospital bed, the official caused septicemia from complications following an unknown animal attack. No one ever believed our real story. Hell, sometimes I barely believe it myself. The image of that creature, its gaping maw and eyes filled with a hunger more primal than anything I'd ever seen it still haunts my dreams. The park rangers wrote it off, maybe a rogue wolverine, 
maybe a mutated grizzly made aggressive by some freak environmental factor. The truth, what Ethan and I both know, is there are shadows deeper in those woods than anyone wants to admit. The Alaskan wilderness, they tell you it's the last big untamed place. After that trip, I learned a hard lesson, some places are meant to stay untamed. Some things you don't track down, they track you. My name is Eli Bennett, and this happened to me back in September of 2012. I worked as a wilderness guide in the Grand Tetons, a kind of job that made folks back home jealous. Yeah, there were grisly warnings and the occasional lost tourist, but it mostly involved leading hikes and babying middle-aged couples through their adventurous midlife crises. It was the start of fall, that crisp edge to the air, and I was leading a routine three-day trek for a group of city slickers. We had a businessman from Chicago, an ex-yoga instructor turned suburban housewife, and a college kid with more gear than sense. Standard bunch. They were all about the sweeping mountain views and Instagram perfect moments. Me? Well, I was a sucker for the quiet spots, places where the trees grew close and the only sound was the crunch of leaves beneath your boots. That kind of place is where we set up camp on the second night. A valley nestled between two peaks, dense pines, a creek bubbling nearby. As the sun began dipping behind the mountains, the businessman, Warren, was complaining about the lack of cell service. I had to bite back a grin at that one. After a freeze-dried dinner no one was keen on, Jenna, the ex-yoga instructor, insisted on some guided meditation. It was all breathe in the mountain air and feel your connection to nature. I kept my distance, preferring to busy myself prepping for the next day. When the group settled into their tents for the night, I couldn't shake an odd feeling. Like I was being watched. Not paranoia exactly, more a prickling at the back of my neck, an instinct toned from years in the woods. Chalked it up to the silence the deepening twilight playing tricks on my eyes. So, naturally, I decided a solo walk was exactly what I needed. Without a headlamp, the forest wrapped inky shadows around me. Usually, the darkness held a comforting familiarity. Not that night. The air thrummed with an uneasy stillness, the rustling of leaves amplified. It made my skin crawl. That's when I saw it, a pair of eyes reflecting the barest sliver of moonlight. Yellow, unblinking, set too high for any animal I knew. A jolt of fear shot through me, but I forced myself to stay still, to observe. The silhouette shifted, and my breath hitched in my lungs. This creature, it stood on two legs towering at least nine feet tall. Lanky, its limbs were too long, its joints bent at impossible angles. The skin stretched hairless across its bones, an unhealthy grayish pallor. In the head, it was elongated, the jaw jutting forward, lined with rows of jagged, blood-stained teeth. My rational mind screamed, some genetic mountain lion mutation. My gut, hardwired for danger, was wailing a different tune. For a frozen minute, we simply stared at each other. Then it moved. Not with the grace of a natural predator, but with jerky, spasmodic twitches. A growl, low and rumbling, began in its chest. In that terrifying instant, I knew I wasn't being hunted. I was being studied assessed. Survival instincts kicked in. I whirled around and ran. The creature let out a piercing shriek that echoed through the valley lights bobbed in the distance, my group. 
My lungs burned, my legs were pistons, but the scrabbling sounds behind me were getting closer. I could smell its rank breath, hot and foul on the back of my neck. The campsite burst into view. I roared, get out. Run. My clients, startled awake, looked at me in confusion, then at the darkness beyond the firelight. They saw the creature launch from the forest, and whatever city-bred skepticism they carried vanished. Jenna screamed. Warren, in pure businessman panic mode, grabbed a hiking pole and charged forward, swearing a blue streak. The college kid bolted for the trees with surprising agility. The creature snatched up Warren in one skeletal hand, lifted him effortlessly. There was a sickening crunch, a strangled yelp, then silence as the creature vanished back into the darkness. Me and Jenna scrambled to gather our things. I yelled at her, we go east. Rivers that way. Keep moving. I didn't know what else to do. Our survival depended on reaching some form of civilization, but the knowledge of what lurked in the shadows sent a wave of despair crashing over me. Hours of running, stumbling through the undergrowth, the rising sun painting the world in streaks of orange and pink. It should have felt hopeful, but only the creature's echoing screeches in the distance drove us forward. By noon, we found a sliver of dirt road. Half delirious with exhaustion, it was still a toss-up whether it would lead to salvation or further into the wilderness. Jenna broke down then, sobs racking her body. I couldn't blame her. We'd seen something no sane person could believe. Something out of nightmares. The road twisted through the foothills, and with trembling hope, we followed it. I don't know how many miles we covered half walking, half crawling, fueled by terror in the fading warmth of the sun. Then the road began a slow ascent, and as we rounded a bend, there it was. Not a town, not even a house. An abandoned shack perched on the edge of a cliff. Its boards were weathered gray, windows boarded over. A chill ran down my spine, not the good kind. That shack wasn't shelter. It was a tombstone with its name worn smooth by time. But as I turned to look back into the thick of the forest, I saw a flash of movement the glint of those inhuman eyes. The choice was made for us. We stumbled inside the shack, the wood groaning under our weight. I used my pack straps to barricade the warped door as best I could. Jenna had curled into a shaking ball in the corner, whispering prayers or curses I couldn't tell which. The sun sank, throwing monstrous shadows across the dirt floor. Every creak, every rustle of wind was the creature circling, testing our flimsy sanctuary. It's been three days since then. The water from my pack is long gone, and the gnawing hunger is almost as brutal as the waiting. I know rescue isn't coming. No one would think to look for us out here. But we can't leave. The second we step foot outside... Sometimes, I see Jenna looking at me with a strange glint in her eyes. She was strong once, maybe there's a way out, a desperate solution. But it makes me think, maybe the creature isn't the only monster out here. My name is Declan Murphy, and this happened to me in September of 2010. I was working for the U.S. Forest Service, stationed in the wilds of Montana's Glacier National Park. Always loved the mountains, the crisp air, the sense of something bigger out there, dwarfing all your human worries. Figured it was the perfect job for a guy like me, bit of a loner, happiest with a pack on my back and a trail ahead of me. 
I was tasked with a solo, multi-day backcountry patrol, mostly routine stuff. Check remote campsites, clear blowdowns, make sure overzealous tourists weren't feeding the bears. Day three of the patrol, I stumbled onto something that was decidedly not routine. This part of the park was rugged, not one of the scenic tourist routes. I was picking my way through a steep ravine, the sound of the creek below a steady rumble. That's when I saw it. An old, weathered boot sticking out from behind a boulder. My heart did a funny little double thump. Hikers go missing sometimes, accidents, weather, bad luck. But a gnawing feeling settled in my gut. Cautiously, I edged around the boulder. It was a man, sprawled in an unnatural position, half submerged in the icy water of the creek. I rushed over, scrambling down the loose rocks, trying in vain to ignore the surefire signs that the guy wasn't just napping. Up close, it was worse than I thought. His body, it looked twisted, limbs bent at wrong angles. And his torso. It was ripped open, organs exposed. My stomach lurched. This wasn't accidental. I scanned the area, heart pounding, but found no trace of struggle, no footprints other than my own. It was as if he'd simply, appeared here, already like this. I backtracked a few paces, trying to control my breathing. Okay, think. I snapped some photos, careful not to disturb anything more than I already had. The ranger in me forced itself to the forefront. I couldn't linger on the grisly horror of it. Protocol kicked in. Radioing my find, I described the scene in clipped tones, trying to keep my voice steady. When they asked about possible animal involvement, I hesitated. It looked deliberate, I said, almost surgical. The silence on the other end of the line crackled. A few hours later, the cavalry arrived. Park rangers, a forensics guy, all with grim faces. They combed through the area meticulously. More photos were taken, measurements made. I stood off to the side, feeling useless and sick to my stomach. While they worked, I slipped away from the group, following the creek bed downstream. If the killer was human, maybe they'd left a trace. The late afternoon sun cast long shadows through the trees, the silence broken only by the relentless chatter of the water. It felt wrong to be here, like I was walking through somebody's open grave. After a few hundred yards, something snagged my eye. A flash of white lodged against a half-submerged log. I waded over, dread pooling in my gut. It was a scrap of cloth, torn and smeared with dry blood. Chills washed over me as I realized, it was a piece of an expensive, high-tech rain jacket. Not the sort of thing your average lost hiker would wear. When I rejoined the others, I casually mentioned finding the fabric. The forensics guy perked up, bagging it with a surge of grim excitement. Whispers started, poaching ring, maybe? Some rich idiot out for trophies? At first, it seemed like a logical explanation. Almost comforting. This was something we could understand, something human. But as the light faded and a bone-deep chill settled into the ravine, I felt that initial certainty waver. There was a chilling precision to the way that man's body had been left, a sort of display. Like the killer was flaunting its work, leaving behind a grotesque calling card. The days blurred together after that. The area around the crime scene became a flurry of activity. More rangers, FBI even. 
They questioned me about what I'd seen, things that didn't add up, things I wished I hadn't noticed. Then the disappearances started happening. First, it was a couple on a day hike, vanished off a well-marked trail. Then a veteran backcountry guide. Each time, the same eerie signature, bodies found mangled and torn, always placed in plain sight. Some whispered about Bigfoot gone rogue, others blamed a sadistic drifter. I didn't voice the creeping fear that churned in my gut, but I knew there was no human capable of this. Out there, lurking in the dense shadows of the forest, was a different kind of hunter. Something that watched us, stalked us. I could feel its gaze prickling on the back of my neck during my patrols. Every rustle of leaves, every snap twig, became loaded with unseen threat. One night, huddled in my tent, I swore I heard it circle my camp, its ragged breathing mingling with the wind. The creature, I can't bring myself to call it anything else, remained elusive, a ghost haunting the woods. I became obsessed. Neglecting my regular duties, I pored over maps, scrutinized old disappearances. And then I found it, a pattern traced in blood. The killings were following a rough route, snaking deeper and deeper into the heart of the park. It was migrating, or maybe hunting a specific target. I'm out there right now, following that grim trail, armed to the teeth and packing night vision gear. The higher-ups think I snapped. Maybe I did. But I can't sit back and wait for the creature to find me. I have to find it first, try to understand, or stop it. Ahead of me, a towering ridgeline marks the next step on the killer's route. Part of me is terrified. But a deeper part, an older, more primal part, hums with a dark anticipation. My name is Rowan Ellis, and this happened to me back in August of 2010. I spent my summers up in the Olympic Peninsula, trail work mostly, keeping those lush rainforests manageable. Liked being outdoors more than I liked being inside classrooms, that's for sure. That August wasn't no different from the others, at least not at first. Crew was me, old-timer Gary and Kira, a college student earning summer credits. We got assigned a stretch south of the park, old logging roads turned to hiking trails days blended together, sweat and bug spray, the comforting rhythm of clearing brush and patching erosion damage. One afternoon, I was cutting back some stubborn blackberry brambles when I hit something solid thought it was maybe a buried fence post or some logging debris. But when I cleared away the thorns, I saw a bone. Big ones. Too big for deer or elk. They were pale white, bleached by the sun, and there was a strange curve to them, like giant ribs. Now, I'm no expert, but something about that didn't sit right. Human bones, way out here? It made my skin crawl. I hollered for Gary, and he came over, grunting at my overreaction at first. But the longer he looked, the more that seasoned outdoorsman frown deepened on his face. Gary told me and Kira to pack up for the day while he radioed the ranger station. Turns out that discovery triggered a whole mess. Park rangers, then some forensics folks. They wouldn't tell us much, just that it was the situation. Didn't sit well with me, knowing there were bones near where we'd been camped. Two days later, they cleared us to keep working, but the vibe was off. Gary became more watchful, less talkative. Kira, bless her, tried to keep things light with nature trivia and cringeworthy puns. But the woods felt empty. Eerily quiet, 
like everything was holding its breath. That night, none of us slept well. Next morning started regular enough, but by midday, a thick fog rolled in. Not unusual for the peninsula, but this kind felt different. Heavy, smothering, like it was creeping under your skin. We lost sight of each other in the white haze. I was yelling their names, moving blind, the muffled sound of their calls the only thing guiding me. I tripped, rolled down a slope, and slammed into a tree trunk. Pain shot through my ankle. Damn. And that's when I saw it. Not through the fog, but within it. Two pricks of light, a sickly yellow, cutting through the swirl a few feet in front of me. Then came the shape resolving. A nightmare on two legs. The creature was easily ten feet tall, thin to the point of emaciation. Skin hung like loose gray fabric on its bones, stretched so tight I could see the pulse thumping in a vein along its neck. Its head, it was skull-shaped, but stretched out long, with a jaw full of sharp teeth. I can't tell you animal instinct kicked in, because there was nothing natural about this thing. I scrambled backward, my hands fumbling in the dirt. Found a fallen branch, thick, heavy, and I gripped it like a lifeline. The creature didn't charge or move fast. It tilted its head, studying me, like it had never seen a human before. A low, wet growl came from its throat, and it took a single slow step closer. And another. I was screaming then, less out of fear, more to break that heavy silence. I swung the branch in a wide arc, the end connecting solidly with its chest. There was a crack, a surprised gurgling noise, and for a second, I thought maybe I'd driven it back. But then it lunged. Fast as a snake, its skeletal hand snatched my makeshift club and snapped it like a twig. It let out a piercing shriek that sliced through my ears and grabbed for me. I twisted, rolled, hearing a rip as its decaying claws shredded my backpack. Then, I was on my feet, running blind, the pain in my ankle a distant echo. Branches whipped my face, but I didn't dare stop. I could hear it behind me, its rasping breath and the snap of foliage as it gave chase. Stumbled out onto a dirt road, the slap of my boots echoing through the empty stillness. I risked a look back, the fog swirling and thinning. It was there, standing at the edge of the tree lean, its glowing eyes burning holes in the mist. It stood still as a statue, watching. A car. It appeared on that deserted road just then, like a miracle. Driver was an older gentleman, saw the state I was in and pulled over without question. I was babbling by then, something about the woods, the creature. He must have thought I was whacked out on something. But the look in his eyes changed when I led him back to the spot where I broke through the fog. There were traces. My ripped backpack, a smear of blood on the ground, mine, most likely. And in the soft dirt, footprints, not quite human, with claws longer than your fingers. The rangers found us there, along with Gary and Kira. They came running through the forest, relief washing over them when they saw us alive. But they were also grim. It turns out they'd found the remains higher up, the rest of that huge skeleton. Human bones, decades old with those same weird bite marks. And, others, more recent. Missing hiker reports stretching back years started fitting a pattern. That, thing had been hunting out there for who knows how long. Gary retired after that. Kira switched to library science. And me? Well, I still work outdoors, 
but I stick to coastal paths and well-maintained park trails nowadays. Sometimes, late at night, I imagine catching a flicker of yellow light at the edge of my vision. I tell myself it's nothing, maybe a trick of the eye or an animal. But that memory of standing on the edge of that fog, looking into the eyes of the impossible, that doesn't ever quite go away. My name is Declan Murphy, and this happened to me out in the backcountry of Yellowstone in the fall of 2016. I was a seasonal ranger back then, young, fit, and maybe a touch too cocky. It's why I volunteered to head up to the northern stretches of the park for boundary patrol. Most folks stuck to the boardwalks and geysers. Up where I was, it was pure untamed wilderness. I liked it that way. October came with a sharp chill and that smell in the air that tells you winter's around the corner. The aspen leaves had gone gold, the elk bugling echoed eerily through the valleys. Days were crisp, nights were biting cold. That's the thing about wilderness, it flips the script on you, from comforting to harsh in the blink of an eye should have paid more attention to that fact. I was on the third day of my patrol, miles from any roads. Camped near a creek, a fire warming my toes, when I heard it, a snap, like a thick branch breaking underfoot. Now, elk, moose, those make noise. But this was different. Lighter somehow, a rhythm to it, too deliberate for a grazing animal. My hand found the butt of my pistol, more out of habit than real worry. Then it clicked in my brain. The stories. Old timers spun them over beers, spooky tales of things glimpsed deep in the woods, a tall, skeletal figure with glowing eyes, whispers of vanished hikers nobody ever found. Had a good chuckle at those my first season. Figured those guys drank too much park water. But out here, alone with the fire crackling, those stories felt a bit less far-fetched. I stood, every sense on high alert. The crackling of the campfire masked any footsteps, but the hairs stood up on the back of my neck. There was something watching me, that much was certain. Hello? I called out my voice sounding too small in the vastness. No answer. No elk calls, no rustling wind. Just a silence so deep it pressed down on my eardrums. Then I saw them, the eyes. Twin spots of yellow light, bobbing above a stand of pines. Way too high for anything normal. The creature stepped out of the darkness. The campfire illuminated it in bursts of orange as the flames danced. At least eight feet tall, bone thin, with stretched, parchment-like skin that hung loose off its frame. The head, that's what made my blood run cold. It was long, the jaw jutting out below a tiny slit of a nose with rows of pointed teeth. Those yellow eyes burned with a chilling intensity. For a heartbeat, we were frozen. It, assessing me. Me, trying to comprehend what the hell I was looking at. Then the creature tilted its head, let out a low, guttural growl, and lunged. I fired my pistol, more out of panic than aim. One shot, two, echoing in the stillness. It seemed unfazed, barely even flinched. I stumbled backwards, fear jolting me into action, and sprinted towards my pack. My survival kit. Machete. That's what I needed. It wasn't much, but it was better than nothing. The creature was gaining fast, its movements impossibly swift and silent for its size. I ripped through my gear heart thundering so hard I could hardly hear myself think. 
then my fingers closed around the machete's grip. I swung around, raising the blade as the creature reached me. It let out an ear-splitting shriek and snatched at the machete with a skeletal hand. I dodged, felt its claws tear across my arm, leaving a trail of hot pain. Before it could recover, I swung the machete in a vicious arc. There was a choked gurgle, a sickening crunch, and then the creature went staggering back. I saw the deep gash along its arm, dripping dark liquid that steamed when it hit the ground. And I saw something flicker in those yellow eyes. Not fear, exactly, but, weariness. A grudging acknowledgement. I didn't wait for it to regroup. I turned and ran, clutching the machete in my throbbing hand. I heard the crashing behind me, smelled that sour, rotten stench of its breath, but I didn't dare look back. Branches whipped my face, but I kept running, fueled by pure terror. I heard the creak up ahead, prayed I could cross it before the creature caught up. Stumbled out into a rocky clearing and splashed through the icy water. On the other side, I collapsed, gasping for breath. When I looked back across the creek, there was nothing. No yellow eyes lurking in the shadows, no sound of pursuit. It was, gone. Had I managed to drive it back? Shock and adrenaline numbed the pain in my arm. I stumbled on, fueled by desperation to put distance between me and that clearing. Found a dirt road eventually, flagged down a truck. The driver, a grizzled rancher, looked at my blood-soaked sleeve and didn't ask too many questions. Got bandaged up in a hospital, told them it was a bear attack. They raised their eyebrows, but they'd seen enough out in the backcountry to roll with strange stories. And me? I quit the ranger gig after that. Couldn't shake the feeling the knowledge that there are things in the dark woods the maps don't warn you about. Sometimes, ignorance is bliss. Sometimes the campfire stories are a hell of a lot closer to the truth than you think. To this day, I don't know what I encountered. Demon, cryptid, something else entirely, whatever it was, it still haunts my nightmares. I carry a scar on my arm now a jagged line that burns every time winter rolls around. It's a reminder that the wilderness is wilder than we ever imagine, and that some mysteries are best left unsolved. My name is Travis Cole, and this happened to me back in September of 2013. Ex-military, turned wilderness guide out in Colorado kind of job where you gotta have your feet planted firm, head on straight. I figured I'd seen the worst of what the world could dish out in my tours. That was, until I took on that backpacking trip deep in the San Juan Mountains. Group was small, just me and a couple. We had Sarah, early thirties, one of those find-yourself-in-nature types. And then there was Rick, a sixty-something accountant who just wanted bragging rights when he got back to his office. They seemed harmless enough on day one, smiles and excited chatter. The San Juans, they're rugged. Jagged peaks, dense pine forests, the air so thin it makes your lungs burn. Beautiful, but unforgiving. Place earns its reputation. That first day was uneventful, thankfully. The trail wound through alpine meadows, still dotted with wildflowers, and the views were breathtaking. That night, we camped by a pristine lake. Sound of a loon calling across the water should have been perfect. But there was a prickling at the back of my neck that I couldn't shake. It wasn't the altitude that I was used to. It was something else. 
That second morning, we headed into denser woods. The trail got narrower, the canopy overhead dimming the sunlight to an eerie greenish tint. Then it started. Faint at first, like snapping twigs off in the distance. I stopped the group, hand up for silence. They looked at me, confused. Heard nothing over their own heavy breathing. But those snaps were getting closer. I pulled out my radio, called for any rangers in the area. Static. No signal. Out here, you're on your own. Just precautions, folks, I said, trying to keep my voice steady, but Sarah and Rick weren't buying it. I could see the unease starting to set in on their faces. The snapping sounds were accompanied by something else now, rustling in the undergrowth. Like something big was pacing us, just out of sight. Sarah looked ready to bolt. I made the decision to move on, keep to the established trail. There was safety in numbers, usually. We came out into a clearing around noon. Old growth trees soared overhead, casting dappled shadows on the forest floor. That's where we found the carcass. It was an elk, or what was left of one. The body was torn open, bones picked clean, but it wasn't the gore that made my stomach churn. It was the precision of it. Not the sloppy work of a bear or mountain lion. This was almost surgical. A chill ran through me, despite the warmth of the sun. Then Rick cried out and pointed a shaky finger upward. Hanging from a high branch, swaying lightly, was a crude symbol, made of twigs and what looked worryingly like human hair. I'd seen enough in my time overseas to know this wasn't some bored hiker's prank. I ushered Sarah and Rick away from that spot as fast as I could. It was time to lose the trail. Out here, that's a gamble, but against whatever left that gruesome offering, it felt like our only chance. We bushwhacked our way deeper into the woods, trying to stick to higher ground so we could keep an eye on our back trail. That's when we saw it for the first time. A flash of movement between the trees, too tall, too fast, to be natural. Sarah gasped, and Rick let out a muffled curse. Whatever it was, it had been dogging our steps. We had to keep moving, no matter how tired we were getting. The sun dipped low, casting long shadows making it almost impossible to see in the growing dimness. We found a crevice to hunker down in for the night, took turns keeping watch with barely any sleep. The sounds outside the crevice, they weren't animal. Footfalls, yes, but a strange, uneven gait. And there was a guttural breathing, punctuated by this clicking sound that made my teeth ache. Dawn came, and with it, a decision. We couldn't stay hunkered down forever. I drew out a plan in the dirt. We'd try to reach a ridge I knew of, radio for help from high ground. It was a risky scramble, but less so than waiting to see what the creature had planned for us. We'd made it halfway up the slope when Rick screamed. I whirled around to see him flailing, something impossibly long and skeletal wrapped around his torso. It jerked him backwards, off his feet and into the trees. There was a sickening crunch, followed by a strangled gurgle that cut off abruptly. Sarah turned and ran, blind panic pushing her now. Me, I charged forward, yelling more out of rage than any real hope of saving Rick. I glimpsed the creature as it retreated deeper into the forest, bone-thin limbs, stretched, grayish skin, and a skull-like head with eyes that burned like hot coals. I chased until my lungs threatened to burst, but there was no sign of Rick, no sign of the creature. 
nothing but the lingering echo of his screams and the sound of my own ragged breaths. Sarah was gone too. Vanished. Probably smarter than me, running in the opposite direction, keeping low. It was down to me now, me and my fading hope of seeing another sunrise. I'm still out here. I know the creature is too. The clicks and the snapping branches follow me night and day. Sometimes, I catch glimpses of it, lurking in the shadows. It seems to be playing some cruel game. Waiting. Maybe it's waiting for hunger to do its work. Maybe it's waiting for my sanity to snap. My name is Ezra Yates, and this happened to me back in 2009 in the Gila National Forest. I'm a seasoned outdoorsman, back then I was working for the Forest Service, trail maintenance mostly. Figured that being familiar with the backcountry would make me immune to those campfire horror stories you hear, but, well, let's just say I don't tell those around a fire anymore. Gila's rugged territory old volcanic mountains, canyons deeper than they look on a map. It's easy to get turned around out there. I'd been out two weeks solo, fixing up some erosion damage, enjoying the quiet. That quiet's what started to get to me, though. Not just the lack of birdsong, but a stillness that felt unnatural, like the forest itself was holding its breath. Gave me goosebumps, but I chalked it up to spending too long out alone. My last job was way up on an old mining trail, hardly used anymore. The hike up was brutal, the sun beating down like a hammer. When I broke through the tree lean into a clearing, I figured I was at the site. Only problem was, there was a shack there. I'm talking rotting timbers, boarded up windows, the whole creepy abandoned vibe. Wasn't marked on any map I had, and didn't fit with the mining history of the area. Something in my gut said a void, but a storm was rolling in, the kind you didn't want to be caught in on an exposed slope. So, I forced the warp door open, figuring I'd shelter there until the worst passed. Inside was, worse than outside place stank of damp rot and something else, a sharp, metallic smell that made my nose wrinkle. Dust motes danced in the shafts of light through the cracks, and for a second, I swear I saw something scurry into the shadows, something way too big to be a rat. The storm hit then. Thunder that shook the whole shack, rain coming down in sheets. Then the power went out. Not that there was any to begin with, but that sudden pitch blackness, cut off from the world, that's when the fear set in. Because I wasn't alone in there anymore. I heard a shuffling from the back of the shack. Smelled that sour breath, hot on my neck. My hand fumbled for my flashlight, flicked it on. And there it was. The creature hunched in the corner, its back to me tall, at least seven feet, but hunched over on two long, spindly limbs. Its skin was loose, hanging on its bones, an unhealthy grayish color. In the back of its head, it was elongated, leading down to a long, bony jaw jutting out. I couldn't see its face, but something about its posture, the way it tilted its head, it sent a bolt of pure terror through me. This thing wasn't an animal, not sick or deformed. It was something different entirely. I stumbled backwards, tripping over a loose floorboard, and the flashlight beam bounced wildly. The creature whipped around. I saw its face for just a second before it lunged. Two glowing eyes, set deep in a skull-like face. Rows of jagged teeth and a gaping maw. That's the image seared into my brain. I scrambled to my feet, 
the flashlight forgotten, and ran. Burst out of the shack, into the pouring rain. The storm masked the sounds of my escape, but I didn't dare look back. Ran blind, branches tearing at my face, the thunder nearly drowning out my ragged breaths. I tripped, rolled down a ravine, felt a sharp pain in my leg. Didn't stop. Couldn't stop. Finally, stumbled onto a dirt road, collapsed face down in the mud. Lay there until the rain stopped and the sun rose, but I didn't sleep a wink. I could still feel those eyes on me, hot and hungry in the darkness. Come morning, I hobbled back to my truck, barely able to walk on my injured leg. Got myself to a ranger station, and rattled out my story. They looked at me like I'd lost my mind. The search party turned up nothing. No shack, no sign of disturbance, no evidence at all. I was diagnosed with stress-induced hallucinations, sent home. Nobody believed me. I quit the forest service after that. Took up a desk job, traded the silence of the woods for the drone of city traffic. Tried to convince myself it was a nightmare, a product of isolation and bad weather. But something about that shack, that creature, it felt too real, too visceral. Sometimes, in those restless nights when sleep won't come, I think I hear a tapping at my window, like branches, or long, skeletal fingers. I swear I smell that damp rot and charnel house stench outside my door. Then I tell myself it's paranoia, the trauma talking. Only, deep down, I know that thing hasn't forgotten about me. It remembers my scent. It knows I didn't stay out there in the Gila for good. And somewhere, back in those shadowed canyons, it waits. And there are nights when the rational part of me crumbles a little further. The part that tells me the Gila is vast, that even if the creature exists, it could never find me in this labyrinth of concrete and steel. But then a chill runs through me, and a primal instinct, one I thought I'd forgotten, whispers the truth, I'm the prey. And no matter where I hide, it'll always be the hunter. My name is Bryson Hall, and this happened to me back in 2009 while I was on a research trip in the North Cascades. I'm a botanist by trade, the kind who spends more time in the bush than in an office. Don't mind the isolation mostly. Reminds me why I got into this field in the first place. That trip, I was cataloging old growth forest health in a remote section of the park. Rugged country, deep ravines, thick stands of spruce and fir, the works. It's a place that makes you feel small. Like the trees have been around longer than your family name and still will be, long after you're gone. The first few days were routine enough, plot surveys, soil samples, taking notes till my hand cramped. I got in a rhythm the solitude a comfort rather than oppressive. Had a small campsite set up near a creek, a solar panel for charging gear, and enough freeze-dried food to last me two weeks. It was around day four I found it, the clearing. Hidden in a fold of the hills, it was a perfect circle of dried yellow grass. Wrong, somehow, compared to the lush green of everything around it set up my tripod, started taking photos for analysis, trying to pinpoint a cause for the die-off. Then I noticed the bones. Not a whole skeleton, mostly scattered, not on. Too big for a deer, wrong shape for a bear, unease settled in me. Something didn't feel right about this place. Chalked it up to spending too long alone in the woods. Packed up my gear, backtracked out of their double time. That night, the
the dream started. I'm standing in an overgrown forest clearing, moonlight filtering through the branches. There's a presence there, malevolent, just beyond my sight. In the dream, I always try to turn, to see what's behind me, but there's a crushing pressure on my chest, forcing me to stay still. Wake up sweating, heart pounding, with the feeling of ice still on me in the darkness of my tent. Mornings, I'd find myself lingering at the tree lean, dreading the sight of that clearing, but the job had to get done. That day as I worked, there was a rustling on the ridge above me. Looked up in time to see a flash of movement, humanoid, but too quick, too graceful for a hiker. Told myself it was a deer, even though deep down, I knew that wasn't right. Pushed on, finished photographing the clearing, noting a strange absence of birdsong and animal tracks in the vicinity. Suddenly, the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. Heard a crack, like a heavy branch snapping underfoot. Spun around in time to see it duck back into the shadows. It looked like a person, but stretched, impossibly tall and thin. Its skin hung loose as an old garment, with a sickly translucent pallor. The head, it was elongated, the jaw jutting obscenely, filled with sharp teeth. But worst of all were the eyes, burning in the deep shadows with a yellow, hungry light. Stood frozen, blood like ice in my veins. Not an animal. Not human, not in any way we understand the word. Then it let out a hiss that sent shivers down my spine, a sound that wasn't meant for this world. Survival instinct finally kicked in. I dropped everything and ran. Didn't look back, didn't stop until I burst out of the forest, lungs on fire and heart threatening to pound out of my chest. Sprinted all the way back to my campsite, tore it down in record time, and got the hell out of there. The drive back to the ranger station was a blur. I stammered out my report, they patted my hand, said it was stress, too much isolation. Told them I found some skeletal remains, probably an unreported missing hiker, and they actually seemed more concerned about that. Took some time off, tried to convince myself it was a breakdown, a hallucination. But the dreams didn't stop got worse. More real, more visceral. That crushing fear, the feeling of being hunted. Then, last month, I was in the city, walking home from the grocery store. Glanced down an alleyway, and for a split second, I saw it. Crouched in the shadows, watching me with those dead yellow eyes. It vanished before I could get a good look but I know what I saw. It knows where I am. Sometimes I wonder if that clearing was where it lives, or maybe it was just a hunting ground. Maybe the bones I found weren't the first, or the last. All I know for sure is that it's real, it's out there, and it hasn't forgotten me. I moved. Changed my name even, but that feeling of being watched, it never goes away. I bought a gun, learned to use it, but I don't know if bullets would even stop that thing. Nights are the worst, every creak of the floorboards, every flicker of shadow, it sets my teeth on edge. I don't sleep much anymore. Some people tell me it's PTSD, that the mind can play tricks. But they haven't been to that clearing. They haven't looked into those eyes. Maybe I am going crazy. Or maybe the crazy ones are the ones who think we're alone in this world, that old things don't linger in the deepest shadows of the wild. My name's Rowan Walsh, and this happened to me back in 2012. I was a seasonal wildlife biologist working in the Olympic Mountains, 
mostly tracking elk migration patterns, that kind of thing. Solitude, fresh air, it pays the bills and lets me get away from cities for months at a time. Or, it used to. July of that year, I was assigned to a pretty remote research site. One of those old logging camps converted into a field station, single cabin, solar power, the works. Took me two days on foot just to reach the place, all dense forest and steep ravines. The isolation was exactly what I craved, even if it meant packing in a month's worth of supplies. Settling in was easy. Cabin was dusty, but functional. Had a week to kill before my tracking equipment arrived, so I started mapping out a survey grid in the area. Found a game trail heading uphill, decided to follow it as a starting point. Figured there'd be good foraging at higher elevations attracting the elk. Second day out, the trail got weird. Found the carcass of a deer. Not wolf kill or cougar. That much was clear, this looked almost, picked clean. Now, I've seen predator handiwork, but this was different. Precise. Almost surgical. Made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Took some photos, marked the location, and hightailed it back to the cabin. Back at base, tried radioing in to report the find. Nothing but static. Figured it was the terrain, no big deal. The rest of that week was uneventful, thankfully. Survey work was mindless, but kept me busy. It was the nights that got to me. The silence up there wasn't natural. Not just quiet, but the dead kind of silent, like the whole forest holding its breath. Made you edgy. I'd wake up in the dead of night to the sound of snapping twigs, footsteps just outside my window. Figured it was deer at first. But the sounds, they were too heavy, too deliberate. Skin started to crawl, every time. Then came the dreams. Not nightmares exactly, but vivid, disturbing. I'd dream of walking in deep woods mist swirling around my feet. There would be this feeling of being watched, of eyes peering through the leaves. And in the dream, I always knew something was behind me, but was too afraid to turn around. The day my equipment arrived, I almost kissed the delivery guy. He was only there for ten minutes, but it broke the tension. Hauling those crates to the cabin, setting it all up, it felt like a return to normalcy. Like there were rules to the world again. That night, I actually slept soundly. The next morning, I started down my planned survey route, gear loaded. I was barely an hour out when something caught my eye. A flash of white, high on a ridgeline. At first I thought it was a patch of late season snow. Then it moved. I froze. Adrenaline hit me like an icy wave. It was big, too big for any animal around here. Lanky, almost emaciated looking, with deathly pale skin. The shape of it was just, wrong. The head, too long, the way it held itself, instinct screamed at me that this thing was not natural. It was gone a second later, vanished into the trees. I barely breathed as I scanned the ridgeline. Nothing. Whatever it was, it had been watching me. I turned to leave. Got about five steps before I heard the crack of a branch behind me. Whirled around, camera in hand, heart pounding. It was there, crouched low in the brush maybe twenty feet away. The height of it, my breath hitched. Too tall and thin to be a bear, not the right build. 
its skin stretched tight over bone, sickly gray in color. And the face, I'll never unsee that face. Skull-like, stretched into a long muzzle, with a row of jagged teeth. But the eyes were worst. Big, pupilless, and glowing with a dull yellow light. They burned into me, and I felt a primal terror I'd never known before. This thing, it was not just a predator. It was something far more wrong, far more cunning. I dropped my gear, turned and ran. I didn't stop running until I was back at the cabin. Barricaded the door, didn't sleep that night. Just lay awake, staring into the darkness, waiting. Every rustle outside sent a jolt of panic through me. Next morning, I destroyed my equipment, smashed it to pieces so it couldn't be of any use. Packed up and radioed for an emergency evac. The guys who picked me up thought I'd cracked under the pressure. Hell, maybe I had. Didn't try to convince them otherwise. Never went back to the Olympics after that. Couldn't shake the feeling, the knowledge that there are corners of the wilderness the maps don't show. Places where old things linger, things that see humans as just another kind of prey. Absolutely. Here's a chilling and suspenseful thriller horror story crafted to your specifications. Please note that it contains graphic violence and disturbing content. My name is Rowan Ellis, and this happened to me in the fall of 2008. I was a park ranger in the sprawling expanse of Glacier National Park, Montana. It's the kind of job that gets into your blood the crisp air, the towering peaks, the sense of something vast and wild all around. I'd been patrolling the remote backcountry for years, knew the trails better than the lines on my own hand. So, when the call came in about a missing hiker near Triple Divide Pass, a prickle of unease went down my spine. Triple Divide wasn't for the faint of heart rugged, unforgiving terrain, easy to get lost. I grabbed my gear, notified my supervisor, and headed out. The missing hiker, a grizzled veteran outdoorsman named Harlan Koch, had last been seen three days prior. My gut twisted. That long in the wilderness, chances of finding him alive were slim. The first two days of the search turned up nothing. No sign of Harlan, no fresh tracks, no campsite remnants. The forest swallowed him whole, and the silence was eerie. I was checking an old game trail when I found it, a boot ripped and stained with something dark. A wave of nausea washed over me as I realized it wasn't mud. The discovery kicked off a desperate frenzy. More rangers descended on the area, combing every inch of triple divide. Then, Another piece of Harlan turned up. Just a hand this time, severed, fingers gnawed to the bone. It was positioned at the base of a tree, almost like a grotesque offering. The sight chilled me to the core. This wasn't an accident. Something out there was hunting. The park officials wanted to shut down the search, deem it too dangerous. I couldn't let Harlan's fate be forgotten, not like this. So, I made a risky decision I'd go in alone, off the record. Armed with my rifle, and an overwhelming sense of dread, I ventured deeper into the woods. Night fell quickly in the forest, shadows deepening into an impenetrable black. I stumbled along, every snap twig making me jump. I didn't like being the hunted instead of the hunter. Then I saw it, a flicker of movement near a stand of pines. I froze, rifle raised. At first, I thought it was a bear, reared up on its hind legs. 
but as it stepped into the sliver of moonlight, my blood ran cold. It was tall, too tall, impossibly lean, like someone stretched the proportions of a human all wrong. The skin was taut, a sickly, mottled gray. But its head, that was the worst. Long and narrow, a protruding jaw lined with teeth like jagged shards of glass. Its eyes, they were pure black pits, reflecting nothing but an ancient, bottomless hunger. For a frozen moment, we stared at each other. Then, it lunged. I fired, the rifle roaring in the stillness. Whether I hit it, I couldn't tell. The creature vanished into the trees, its inhuman screeches echoing through the night. Shaking, I stumbled back to my truck, the weight of what I'd seen crushing my spirit. The next morning, I led a team of rangers back to the spot. No trace of the creature could be found. They looked at me like I was crazy when I recounted the attack, and who could blame them? The official report listed Harlan as a likely fatality due to a bear or mountain lion. The truth was buried, dismissed as a ranger's hallucination brought on by stress and exhaustion. But I know what I saw. Harlan wasn't the first. Over the next few years, there were whispered rumors other disappearances in the park, hikers vanishing without a trace gruesome finds that were quickly hushed up. I kept doing my job, patrolling the trails, but now with a constant unease prickling at my neck. Words spread among the other rangers, a sort of dark joke about the triple divide monster. Some even claimed to have caught glimpses of it themselves, fleeting shadows at the edge of their vision. The thing preyed on lone hikers, those venturing far from the beaten path. It was cunning, knew how to stalk, how to vanish, how to leave behind only the faintest hints of its brutal violence. I tried tracking it, setting traps, but it was futile. The creature was a phantom, a predator woven into the very fabric of the wild. In the end, it was the fear that broke me, the constant dread clawing at the back of my mind. I love the mountains, but I couldn't live under that shadow anymore. I put in for a transfer, left Glacier National Park behind. Sometimes, late at night, I still jolt awake, the image of that elongated skull and those hungry black eyes seared into my memory. The thing's still out there, I know it. Lurking, watching, waiting for the next hiker to stray too far to become prey. My name is Kellen Scott, and this happened to me back in the fall of 2014. I'm a National Park Ranger, was, at least, back then. Worked patrols in Yosemite, the kind most tourists never see. Makes you appreciate the grandeur but also reminds you that nature can turn on a dime. Learn that lesson the hard way. I was nearing the end of a two-week solo patrol, deep in the backcountry. It was my last night, supposed to hike out at dawn. Had my tent pitched in a small clearing, a fire going, the usual. Peaceful is what it should have been that last sliver of solitude before heading back to HQ. But something was off. There was a feeling of being watched. Not animal instinct, this was different, more deliberate. Figured I was getting spooked by the isolation, so I made my rounds, checked my perimeter. Nothing. Ate my dinner and turned in early, but sleep wouldn't come. The rustling sounds, they got closer. Like something circling my campsite. And then there was the smell, like rotting meat mixed with wet fur. Stomach turned, but I forced myself to lay still. Couldn't show fear. 
whatever it was out there might be curious, but showing weakness would change that equation fast. Heart pounding, I reached for my flashlight and pistol, the safety clicking off. Something was definitely out there, just beyond the circle of firelight. I flicked on the light, aimed it into the darkness, and that's when I saw them, two eyes, reflecting back a sickly yellow glow. Way too high for a bear, wrong shape for a mountain lion. The creature stepped into the light. I'll never forget that sight. It was easily eight feet tall, skeletally thin, with skin stretched so tight over its bones that it looked almost translucent. The head was wrong. It was long, the jaw jutting out under tiny slits for nostrils. But the eyes, they burned with a cold intelligence. It didn't make a sound, just tilted its head, studying me. I fired a warning shot into the air. The creature flinched slightly, but didn't retreat. Just stared, the calculation in those eyes making my skin crawl. Then, it did something that still haunts my nightmares. It mimicked the sound of my gunshot. Not a natural sound, not an echo, but a chillingly accurate imitation. Panic surged through me the rational ranger part of my brain overridden by pure terror. I fired again, and again, driving the creature back into the shadows. Reloaded, shaking, I scanned the darkness beyond the firelight. Nothing. But I knew it was still out there. Huddled in my tent the rest of the night, gun in hand, straining to hear any sound over the pounding of my heart. Dawn couldn't come soon enough. I broke camp in record time, practically ran those first few miles, the cold certainty of being hunted fueling every step. Got back to HQ midday, disheveled, sleep-deprived, and rambled out my story to the head ranger, expected disbelief. Instead, he went pale. Turned out there'd been a rash of missing hiker reports in that area. No bodies found, just abandoned gear, scraps of torn clothing. They figure animal attacks, but my story, it fit an unsettling pattern. The higher-ups called in a special investigation team. Swooped in with all the tech, trail cams, the works. A week later, they packed up and left. Found nothing definitive explained it away as my imagination running wild. Nobody wanted to believe there was something out there in Yosemite that their fancy equipment couldn't find. Me? I quit soon after. Not just the trauma, which is real, don't get me wrong, but something else. Like the creature knows I saw it. Knows who I am. Every time I go hiking, even on crowded trails, I feel that prickle on the back of my neck, the suspicion that I'm not the one doing the watching. A few years ago, a friend forwarded me an article. Hiker gone missing, same area of Yosemite. No remains, just gear, and a crude drawing on a scrap of tent fabric. It was a crudely sketched skull-like face with long, pointed teeth. The drawing made my blood run cold. Sometimes, in the quiet of my apartment, I swear I can smell that damp rot odor again. And I wonder, is it hunting me? Or biding its time? Is it remembering, the way I can't forget? I got my concealed carry permit after Yosemite. Don't know if a bullet can stop whatever that thing is, but I figure it's the only shot I've got. And the next time I venture into the deep woods, I won't go alone. My name is Declan Tate. This happened back in 2016. I'm a hiker, the hardcore kind. 
through hikes, wilderness expeditions, that's my thing. People think it's about finding peace in nature, but for me, it's the opposite. Putting yourself out there, where the rules of civilization don't apply, that's where you find something raw and real. That summer, I was tackling a chunk of the Appalachian Trail in Maine. Rugged stretch, mostly dense forest, old fire roads, the occasional abandoned cabin. I don't mind roughing it. Gives you a primal sense, being out there alone with whatever else the wilderness holds. Packed enough supplies for two weeks, didn't expect to see another soul. About a week in, I was hiking along a ridgeline when I stumbled upon a game trail. Not surprising, except, there was something off about it. Too well worn for deer, and the tracks I did find were wrong, too large, misshapen somehow. Curiosity overcame common sense. Figured maybe a bear with a deformed paw, or some such thing. Decided to follow it, just for a little way. That trail led me deeper into the woods than I meant to go. It felt like I was walking for hours, the trees closing in overhead, the afternoon light dimming. Found myself in a small clearing. Not natural, this one. The ground was bare dirt, and there was a pile of things. Rags, bones, bits of rusted metal too twisted to figure out what they'd once been. And the smell, it hit me like a physical blow. Rotting meat, mixed with something fouler, a rank, musky odor that I couldn't place. Nausea churned in my gut, but I couldn't tear my eyes away from that pile. That's when I saw the skull. Human. But not quite. The thing was massive, the jaw too long, too heavy for a normal skull. It was perched atop the pile like some kind of grotesque trophy and fresh blood stained the bone beneath it. Adrenaline surged through me. That was it, I was turning back, getting the hell out of there. I turned to leave and that's when I saw it. The creature was maybe twenty yards away, half hidden behind a thick tree trunk. Even in the dim light, I saw it clearly. Too tall, limbs impossibly long and skeletal. Its skin hung loose over its bones, a sickly grayish color. But its head, that's what made my blood run cold. It was elongated, the lower jaw protruding, filled with rows of needle-like teeth. Two eyes burned from deep within the skull, reflecting what little light was left with an eerie yellow glow. It didn't move, just watched me with that chilling stare. For a frozen moment, we were locked in a silent standoff. Then, a twig snapped under my boot, breaking the spell. Instinct took over. I spun around and ran. Didn't think, just put one foot in front of the other, heart pounding in my ears, expecting the feeling of claws digging into my back at any moment. Pushed through the undergrowth, branches whipping at my face, not caring about the trail, about anything but getting away from that clearing. I must have run for miles before I collapsed, gasping for breath. It took hours for my panicked mind to quiet down. Even then, doubt crept in. Stress hallucination, a bear with mange, anything but what I knew I'd seen. Told myself if you don't name the fear, it loses its power. Stumbled back to the at the next day, cutting my trip short. Drove home in a daze, the image of that creature seared into my brain. Didn't talk about it, figured nobody would believe me. Weeks later, saw a news article, missing hiker in Maine, same area I was in. No body found, just gear torn apart. After that, I knew it wasn't my imagination. Tried to go back to those woods, find proof, 
worn people. But that trail, the clearing, they were gone. Like the whole place had rearranged itself to hide the secret I'd uncovered. Now, I'm always looking over my shoulder. Every trip into the woods is tainted, every rustle of leaves making me flinch. Friends joke, say I'm getting paranoid. But I know what's out there. I know it saw me too, knows who I am. Every time I see a flash of movement in the deep woods, a flicker of yellow light, I wonder, is it hunting me? Or biding its time? <laughs>